What's up, guys? It's yo boy I'm the sensei back with a new what if series, reborn as superman's twin. Full movie. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. <laughs> 19.20pm unknown planet, below a large high-tech house, a large underground chamber could be seen. This chamber held many rooms, with each being home to either a laboratory or a workshop. In one of the rooms, a woman could be seen standing over a small oval object that seemed to float above the ground. Inside the oval object, one would find a set of twins sleeping peacefully on a bed. As the woman stood and watched the children while they slept with a smile on her face, the door opened and in walks a man who was wearing what seemed to be armor. What did they say the woman asks turning to the man who now had a frustrated look on his face, what else would they say, they never listened to me. I mean there is proof of what I am saying everywhere the man shouted angrily, why is the council so stubborn the woman asked as she too spotted an equally frustrated look, why would they listen? They're afraid of losing their positions. The planet has only a little over SIX 6 days before it blows up, and they are afraid of losing their positions, I mean I get why they all want to believe Brainiac, but they have all the proof they need the man said, then sat down in one of the empty seats in the well-furnished room. Then what do we do the woman asked worriedly as she knew fully well that the planet was dying even faster than what her husband had estimated, we use plan B, if they refuse to evacuate instead all calling back all troops, because Brainiac says so then we leave or at least save the ones we can, the husband replied with a determined look on his face, no, plan B is too risky, you could die. The military is tasked with watching over all the escape pods and spaceships the woman said to stop her husband I know, but we have a set of spacecrafts, they have no control over, and can track the man said with a smile, the infiltration program the woman called out in realization yes. We may not fit in it, but we can at least save our children the man suggested as he looked into his wife's eyes, as though this was the last time he would see them no, the last time you looked at me this way, you did something stupid, Jor-El what are you planning the woman said in a tone that showed that she wasn't backing down, trust me just this one time, Lara. I will make this well for us and our children the man, Jor-El promised after saying that, Jor-El left the room as he went on pretending as though nothing were wrong as per the request of the council. Meanwhile, back in the room, the woman went back to the floating crib to check on her children, only to see one of them awake and crying. Don't worry dear, everything would be okay she said as she patted the back of the baby as gently as she could, and seconds later, the baby stopped crying, but unlike a normal baby, he didn't go back to sleep instead he took his time looking around with an intelligent glint in his eye unknown to both Jor-El and his wife, Lara Lore Van, they had given life to a reincarnate. James was a normal earthling in his past life, he was your average fresh out of college boy. James was just 23 when he got out of college, he couldn't be identified as one of the rich or well-connected ones who immediately got high-paying jobs after college, but he still did find his way. He came from a middle-class family who had just enough to go by their day and lives. This prompted James to constantly strive for the best and be the best in everything he does. He obviously didn't accomplish this, but he did try his best until the fateful day when he dropped due to overworking. After death, James never expected to regain consciousness again, but he did so anyway and not in a hospital, but in some weird space that words just couldn't describe. In this peculiar space, James didn't meet any being as he had previously read from the many novels or fan fiction and comics he had read instead, he found himself in the weird space with an empty office chair and vacant table. With this odd setup, James had no option but to sit on the chair and wait for whatever that might happen after all he had nothing to lose, but as he sat down, the holographic screen immediately appeared on the table as a survey appeared on it should you be given the chance to either reincarnate or go straight to heaven, which would you choose, this was an incredibly hard question for James in fact, it could be said to be an extremely hard question for any human, because on one hand, you get to live another life. But you may not have your current memories and on the other hand, there was heaven, a place stated and believed to be a paradise, a place of eternal happiness. Yes, to some, eternal happiness may sound like a bad idea, but James considered one thing, when they say eternal happiness. That doesn't mean that you are forced to be happy. You are just granted opportunities and conditions that allow you to achieve genuine happiness. This to James was incredibly hard, but it wasn't exactly that hard to decide once you have thought about it carefully, I choose to reincarnate James replied after all heaven isn't running away, nor will its rules change, because he rejected it for now after reincarnation. 
You are to be granted o n e one wish, what would it be now looking at this question? James didn't even think twice before answering after all the answer had been pounded into him all throughout his lifetime. I would want to be the best version of myself in fact, I would want to be the most perfect version of myself, James replied with a smile, to the current James. He had forgotten that he was dead as at this point, he just thought he was playing a game. After this, many other questions appeared on the screen. Some were hard whilst some were just too simple for him excellent, your results would be out soon, please wait patiently read the screen it was after this that James remembered that he was already dead, and he was probably in a place that judged the souls of man shit. I should have chosen heaven James thought to himself some hours or minutes later, the screen reappeared and on it were the words congratulations, you are now one of the very few that have been chosen to reincarnate. Please let it be noted that, your wish had been modified as the original was too vague seeing this, James couldn't believe his eyes after reading the screen yes. He screamed in joy, and in the next moment, he lost consciousness waking up, he found himself inside some sort of container made of metal, but since he could feel and see the surrounding sheets, he immediately guessed that he was on a bed, but the strange thing he didn't understand, was the size of the metal container, am I a dwarf James thought at first. But everything changed when he started hearing voices among everything that was said, there were only a few words that stood out to him, and they were Brainiac, Jor-El, Allura, and finally the Council. Hearing these words or names in the conversation of the people talking, he instantly guessed where he was shit. I'm in the DC universe James shouted in his mind, but his body took over, and immediately he started crying. As the woman carried him, James immediately felt safe as though he were in his mother's arms. Oh no wait, she is my mother, yay biology James thought, since he knew that the only reason why babies who couldn't even see properly felt safer in their mother's arms, was because of oxytocin, so this is my mother. Wait a minute, Kryptonians banned natural childbirth after the war, and judging from the well-furnished room and no explosive sounds then that means the war had ended, and this woman must be Lara Lore Van, Aka Superman's biological mother, James thought after a brief look around the environment. This small information changed everything after all this simply meant that he was the future Superman. No that's not possible, I mean I can't possibly spend my time saving idiots only to be persecuted for not saving one, that is not the kind of life, I want. I reincarnated to enjoy my life not to become a god enslaved by humankind's whim, James thought slightly angrily as he thought about his new identity, and what it meant that's good, now back to sleep my dear Lara said as she gently placed James back into the crib. In the process of doing so, James finally noticed the other being that was sleeping quietly in the crib, wait I'm a twin, oh, thank god. That means I am not the future Superman James thought happily, as a slight happy and cute chuckle escaped his lips, instantly making a smile on his new mother's face, thinking about this fact, James felt like someone had just lifted a massive burden from their shoulders, but then arose another problem, wait this doesn't change anything, it just reduces the chances of me being the future Superman. There is no guarantee that I am not Kal-El until they name us, James thought as the happy smile on his face instantly disappeared, and was replaced by an extremely troubled look meanwhile, his mother Lara Lore Van just stood there shocked at the expressions she saw on her son's face. She may not be an experienced mother or even have any references for motherhood, but she was sure that this was definitely not normal. Lara stood there observing her son as his expression changed from happy to worried then to curious in just mere minutes, but just couldn't find anything that caused this change. Kryptonians had banned natural childbirth centuries ago and adopted the Genesis Chambers, which basically grows the child from infancy to adolescence, while impacting common knowledge into them. Which simply means that not many Kryptonian knew how to take care of a baby, and the few who knew, are too high up in the council to consult, and thus Lara knew next to nothing about childcare, past what was written in the records which wasn't exactly much to begin with. Days later, Jor-El along with another man, could be seen standing in front of a group of mini spacecrafts. These were the main component of the infiltration program, Project New Worlds. This program was started with the intention to send child soldiers to new worlds, in which they will conquer from within. That was why Jor-El and his younger brother, Zar-El along with a few other scientists and engineers, were tasked with creating little spacecrafts that will contain these genetically modified children, and send them to the various planets without it being spotted by any radar. This project was only brought into the works by the Council, because Krypton was somehow trying to expand their territory, while ignoring the fact that their homeworld was dying. Currently, none of that mattered to neither Jor-El nor his brother Zor-El, both knew that the project was a waste as the planet would never exist past the next day. The brothers had worked harder than they ever had to complete the project, and even upgrade it with a phantom drive. All with a single reason in mind, they had to save their children. 
For Jor-El it was his newborn twins who also happened to be the first and only natural-born children on Krypton, and as for Zor-El, it was to save his daughter who like everyone else on Krypton, was also grown in the Genesis Chamber, but unlike the other Kryptonians, she could be said to be related to both him and his wife, Allura Zor-El by blood. They were both men who somehow found warmth in the cold Kryptonian society. At the moment, they stood in front of a set of completed spacecrafts, now all that remained was to send his children away. I can't believe we are doing this, Zarel said with a heavy heart, because he knew that this last few hours may just be the last time he sees his daughter or even any of his family members ever again I know, but we can't rest now, we aren't done. The Eradicator's hand is still upon our children, we have to remove it, Jor-El said still with a serious look on his face, from his expression alone, Zarel could tell he was even more worried than him, but it wasn't because of the planet's destruction this time. In the past war that nearly destroyed the Kryptonian society, many super weapons had been created, and among them were the greatest weapons known to Kryptonian kind. The Eradicator and the Destroyer. These two weapons do just as their names implied, the Destroyer was created to destroy the planet, and it would have achieved its aim if it was stopped or so they thought while the Eradicator was created to eradicate races with the ability to manipulate genes as easily as breathing. The Destroyer was thought to have been stopped, but contrary to their expectations, they had just slowed the device's rate of destroying the planet, to the extent of it being nearly non-existent, but it was still present as Jor-El had found out, and tried to warn his people about thus the planet had only a day to exist before it is blown up, while for the Eradicator. It altered the genes of the Kryptonians to become tied to the planet in simpler terms, he tied the whole race to the planet, so when the planet ceased to exist, the race too stopped to exist. Minutes later, the brothers left the research facility as they both returned to their homes. Returning home, Jor-El immediately told his wife about his success and convinced her to follow him as he grabbed the child and found his way to his private research lab. What are we doing here, Jor-El are you confident this is safe, what if someone walks in and sees them, Lara asked worriedly, don't worry Lara, the only other person who has access to this place is Zor-El, being a high ranking scientist does come with its perks, Jor-El replies with a smile to make his wife feel at ease a few minutes later, Zor-El entered the lab with his family. A blonde with beauty on par with Lara's and standing beside her was a small girl no older than 12, who was nearly an exact carbon copy of her mother. Good you're here, now let's begin, Jor-El said as he laid the babies into a special platform made for them, this has never been tried before, Jor-El, how do you intend to achieve this, Allura asked, first we have four of Krypton's greatest minds here in one room, and second, it has, why do you think our troops can leave the planet for years or an end without dying? The council has found out ways to relieve us of the Eradicator's curse, but choose not to as it allows a better control on the society, Jor-El explained, as multiple files appeared out of thin air, what? Then that makes things a lot easier, Zarel said after reading the files, then got ready to start their new project minutes into their stay in the lab. The four had already managed to remove the eradicator's hold on Zarel's daughter, Kara Zarel. Wow, I never thought this woe. Lara shouted as the whole lab shook, We don't have much time, Allura said as they all focused on trying to do the same for the twins some minutes later. The four could be seen sitting or standing in the lab with a defeated look on their faces, why wouldn't this work? Jor-El shouted in frustration, the process didn't work for the twins, it had worked on Kara but couldn't work on them, no matter what they tried, is this because Kara was destined to be soldier, Zarel asked, well it doesn't matter, if it doesn't work on natural born, then there is another way of getting it done, Jor-El said in a determined tone as he stood up, but as he stood up, everyone's expression changed, they knew what he meant and knew the danger it brings no, you are not a soldier, and that comes with plenty of risks, Lara said trying to stop him, what could I lose, Lara, the planet is going to kill us all anyway. Please just get the children to the hangar, I will meet you there, I think the quake alarms have already been issued, Jor-El said as he left the room Jor-El may have not been born a soldier, but he currently had the courage of one. He knew that this new task could mean his death, but he was ready to try anyway, after all it meant that his children will survive. He planned to steal the Codex. The Codex was an ancient artifact stored at the center of the Genesis Chamber, it could be the data banks for all the beings born in the chamber. It held thousands of years of genetic information, which helped the Kryptonians achieve the aim of genetically engineering children. It allowed them to select a career path for a child, and modify the child to suit that path, and now Jor-El planned to use that artifact to free his children from the hands of the Eradicator, fusing the codes to them, would automatically free them from the curse, and at the same time, it would grant them an advantage in the fact that they would be the best of all Kryptonians existing. While Jor-El went on his suicidal mission, Zar-El led the others to the hangar which held three small spacecrafts wait, are we just sending our kids out there, where are we sending them, Allura asked when she finally found an error in their plan, I honestly don't know. 
But we can choose the best planets while we wait for Jor-El, Zar-El replied as they immediately went to work searching for planets that weren't too advanced or xenophobic, and had life forms that at least looked like them 30, 30, minutes later. Jor-El stepped into the room injured, but was somehow ignoring the wound's existence, as he immediately got to work looking at the deep and life-threatening wound, the family was compelled to speak, but kept quiet as they knew it was useless, the man was set on allowing his family to survive, and he will do it seconds after Jor-El stepped into the room. Various shouted could be heard from the outside, what do you think you are trying to do Jor-El, an angry voice shouted from behind the door, and accompanying the voice were sounds of the door being blasted with the high-tech guns in the man's possession, I will kill you Jor-El, you shall watch your family die before you. You traitor. The man shouted as he continued shooting meanwhile in the room, Jor-El paid no attention to the door, as he immediately placed a codex on the already prepared apparatus, and seconds later, an exact copy of the codex appeared, get the children Jor-El ordered, and Lar and Allura immediately placed the twins in the arms on the pedestal, commence transfer Jor-El said, and immediately after. The golden line was seen coming from the codex, and its copy into the body of the children, I know this is the last time I will set my eyes upon you, my children, Kal-El he said as he touched the face of one of the twins, and immediately James Hart calmed down. It was finally confirmed, he isn't the future Superman Rao-El, I name you after our son, may you both shine bright, I am sending you three to a world where you would be seen as gods, but I hope your power doesn't blind you. The yellow solar radiations will strengthen your bodies, allowing you to achieve the impossible. I want you to use that power to guide them, and I hope they do you not turn out like us," Jor-El said as tears fell from his eyes, and never forget, we, your parents will always be with you and love you, he did as the others step up to him a few minutes later. The children were already strapped into their various spacecrafts, and the parents stood ready for them to take off the door can't hold on much longer, Zar-El suddenly announced, but Jor-El just smiled, then walked to a secret compartment of the room reaching into the compartment, Jor-El grabbed two battle suits, these were new model exoskeletons that were being developed for the military. But now it was being used against the military. As their parents prepared to probably end their lives while trying to protect their children. James was inside the spacecraft feeling perplexed, aren't the Kryptonians under the red sun, just normal humans, James asked himself surprised. Ever since they arrived at the surface hangar, James had felt strange as though he were being charged up by something, despite the strange feeling, it wasn't exactly hard to guess what was going on, considering that James knew the effect of solar radiation on Kryptonians. So he guessed that his body was absorbing the radiation from this massive red sun, perhaps this is my wish in action, James asked as a smile found its way to his face. His original wish had been to be the best version of himself, but whatever being who had reincarnated him had modified the wish. Though James didn't know the exact extent of this modification, he could at least safely guess that it made it possible for him to absorb energy from the red sun. As James marveled at his the new development, the L brothers had already worn their battle suits, ready to face the angry soldiers behind the door, we'll hold them off. You two send the children out of here, Zar el said as he and his brother walked toward the door with the prototype blasters in hand, the two mothers tried their best to remain calm themselves, as they prepared the spacecrafts for takeoff, and made sure that the two had everything they needed when they landed on the planet. All under the assumption that jor -El had laid down the necessary preparations for the children's landing on the designated planet, but knowing jor -El as well as they did, he probably did. This is the council, all soldiers of Zod are hereby ordered to lay down their weapons, and all members of the L family are hereby placed under arrest, a loud voice said, as a large aircraft appeared in the skies above the hangar, Jor-El and family were in ha Zod you foolish man, you actually tried it ha ha. Jor-El laughed when he realized why Zod and his men too were to be arrested, it matters not, you shall die anyway, Zod replied from behind the door minutes later, the door was broken down, and shots were fired, but among all this chaos, the spacecrafts were already in the air, and about to leave the planet, shoot them down, Zod ordered his men as he faced Jor-El who was now on his knees with a smile on his face, his mission had been accomplished along with Jor-El. Zor-El and their wives also gladly surrendered after all their missions had been achieved, do you know what you have done, Zod shouted in anger as he smashed the butt of his gun on Jor-El's face meanwhile in the mini spacecrafts, James managed to push himself up enough for him to see what was happening on the planet before his departure. As he looked on, James saw multiple anti-aircraft guns or whatever these ones could be called, shooting at them. Multiple missiles fired, but somehow none of them hit them, for a very advanced society, your aiming and weaponry accuracy is terrible he commented. But James knew clearly that this was because of his brother who was still sleeping as though nothing was happening, all hail plot armor, James thought as he sat down to calm down, as earlier his heart nearly found its way out of his body, all due to the fear of one of the missiles touching the spacecraft. 
but somehow they all seemed to hit empty air and exploded as though there was a being out there watching over his brother. A few minutes after takeoff, the spacecraft escaped the planet's atmosphere. Immediately, James felt a massive difference compared to when he was still on the planet. He could feel his body absorbing nearly about two times more solar radiation than it did previously. The cause of this could be easily attributed to the fact that there was currently nothing filtering the radiation anymore. Every planet with an atmosphere filters the amount of solar radiation that reaches the surface of the planet. It was also because of this that humans haven't been burned to a crisp despite being the third planet from the sun. James just laid in the spacecraft as he watched it navigate its way amongst the stars. In his previous life, he wasn't much of a traveler and like many on Earth, he hadn't even seen the borders of his country talkless of traveling to another country, hell he had never even been to a different continent on his planet, but now here he was traveling from one solar system to another. Come to think of it, how far is Earth from Krypton James thought after realizing a small problem. Yes, the spacecraft was modified with a Phantom or Star Drive i.e., if the story still follows canon in any way, but that doesn't mean that this would be a short journey after all Krypton might be in a different galaxy. As the shuttle found its way through space, James' mind was racing as his mind thought of how long the journey would take, but later calmed down since well, in the original story. Kal-El's time of arrival wasn't mentioned, but he remained a baby when he arrived on Earth, so it was safe to say that the spacecraft was fast and frighteningly so. There are other explanations, like Jor-El designed some kind of hibernation mechanism in the spacecraft that controlled growth or something like that. Amongst all the theories that passed through James' head, the only credible one was that the Phantom Drive really lived up to its hype. After finally calming down, James spent the rest of his time admiring the darkness of space, along with the light spots of light that were in the sky. While doing so, James fell asleep since no matter how matured his mind may be, his body wasn't. Hours or days passed as the spacecraft continued on its journey with the two children in it waking up at times and falling back asleep. James couldn't tell the amount of time that has passed, but he did know that despite being here for an extended period of time, both James and Kal-El didn't feel hungry at all, well, technically they did, but it was resolved as soon as it starts. James could tell this wasn't because of their physiology which allowed them to absorb solar radiation. James knew clearly well that the amount of energy he absorbed had reduced by a significant amount ever since the spacecraft really went into hyperdrive, thus he also assumed the same for Cal, so James went with the next best option. Their parents must have installed various life-sustaining components in the spacecraft, which included some kind of nutrient-feeding mechanism. Although James couldn't feel this in action, he could at least tell that whenever he felt hungry, some kind of procedure occurs, and minutes later, the feeling disappears. As their journey continued, they encountered little to no turbulence or trouble, but there was one thing that caused a lot of trouble for James. It was Cal's crying, although all their needs to stay alive were met, they still were babies, and while James had his adult mind to guide him, Cal was still a normal baby, so he cried a lot, and with no one around to soothe the baby. The duty fell on James who could either choose to wait the cry out by allowing Cal to cry himself to sleep, or he could choose to soothe his brother. Obviously, James decided to stop the crying as soon as possible, and it did bring a little entertainment between them. Currently, one could see a small spacecraft flying through space at blinding speeds, but inside it, they would see two babies inside the spacecraft. One of the babies could be seen carrying his brother as he gently patted his back. James had made it a hobby to take care of his brother. He watched the stars when Cal was sleeping or eating and cradled his brother when he was crying. All this was only possible because James was somehow stronger than he thought. If he was correct then his wish had made him the perfect energy absorber, meaning he could absorb all types of energy, in other words, he had absorbed more energy than his brother has, thus making him stronger or at least strong enough to carry himself and his brother, without causing himself any pain. Some time passed and could see the solar system he was familiar with. He had seen it many times on the internet, and though the photos didn't match the real thing, it was still pretty close. The solar system has surprisingly more planets than we thought, but we're all too small to be considered one, James may not have been an expert astrologer, or may not have paid that much attention to anything space related, but immediately he entered the solar system. He knew he was home. Out of excitement, James immediately stood up to see the solar system in all its majesty. As he stood up, James found himself face to face with a large brownish planet. It had multiple layers of different shades of brown on it, and was so large that the spacecraft was nothing but a speck on its surface. Damn Jupiter's big James shouted in his thoughts as he watched the spacecraft find its way to its destination, the third planet from the sun, known to its inhabitants as Earth and to other civilizations as Terra. Oh shit. James thought as he immediately laid down back on his usual spot as he braved for impact. As the spacecraft entered the planet's atmosphere. It immediately started to shake as though it were about to crash, which it surely will. 
Despite all the shaking and turbulence, James didn't feel much of it, as though the space they were in wasn't part of the spacecraft at all. Minutes later, James felt the vehicle smash into the hard ground as it slid across its surface and finally stopped. He may not have felt the turbulence, but he definitely felt the final crash. As expected, immediately the spacecraft landed, Cal immediately started crying, but unexpectedly James also joined in. This was strange for him, but he knew that he had been influenced by two things. One, was the rough landing and two, was the fact that when two babies are in a room together and one starts to cry, the other will join in, and so the two babies laid there in wait as they cried their hearts out. Meanwhile, somewhere not too far away, a car could be seen rushing towards the crash site. A few minutes later, the car was parked just a few meters away from the crash site, as its occupants came rushing out of the car, John be careful, the woman said as she pushed the man gently towards the crash site, the man understanding her gesture, motioned for her to stay back, wait here he said, then reached into the back seat to get a metal baseball bat, then he walked into the field. As James laid there crying, he saw a blurry figure approaching the spacecraft, the figure seemed to be holding some sort of bat-like weapon, oh dear, who would leave innocent children in a place like this. Wait, are they alien babies, John asked shocked as he finally approached the spacecraft, John what's going on there the woman shouted after the man, Martha there are children here, I think they are aliens, John replied A, come here and see, there are babies in this place, John said as he beckoned for the woman to come closer, oh. What a terrible thing, why would someone do such a thing, Martha said as she ignored the weird looking pod we were in, and reached in to carry the children, Martha what do you think you're doing, John asked nearly scared out of his mind, oh will you shut it, does it matter where they came from? They look like regular humans and even cry like one Martha said completely ignoring her husband as she reached in to carry the children, here carry him, Martha said as she passed Cal to her husband, after making sure to soothe him and make him stop crying seeing this, John was beyond horrified, meanwhile James just found it amusing. Though it is a known fact that John and Martha Kent found and raised Cal into what he became, but witness it in person just hit different after somehow managing to convince her husband to carry what he considered baby alien conquerors. Martha reaches in to carry James who instantly stops crying, as though her touch were all he needed to make him feel, as though he had an army of FIVE 5 million around to protect him. In simpler terms, her touch made him feel significantly safer than his powers did. As Martha carried him out of the wreckage, James instantly began to look around, as though to imprint the scene into his mind. Oh look, this one's got a lot more energy than expected, Martha said slightly shocked, but one could easily hear the joy in her tone, Martha, you know this is a bad idea, what if they don't eat normal human food and drink human blood instead, John argued, but as he expected. The woman had long since stopped reasoning as she was too busy making funny faces and smiling as though on drugs with the baby in her arms, meanwhile James just ignored everything happening around as he focused on the faces of his soon-to-be parents. They both looked surprisingly younger than he expected. Martha looked to be in her late twenties, while John looked to be in the early thirties. Martha seemed to be the spontaneous and adventuring type, while John was more of the indoor type of person. They were clearly opposites of each other, but they somehow completed each other better than one would think. James had just met them, but he felt as though the two had a happy and working marriage, oh god help us, John said helplessly as he prayed silently in his heart that the two babies were normal, at least in what they ate and how they behaved. Yes, before I forget, John can you get that space thingy on the truck, Martha called out as she left the field with the two babies in her hands, one sleeping in the other, strangely holding on to his brother, as though he feared he would fall. What John shouted in shock what? Why are you shouting, what if they need it in future to find out where they came from Martha reasoned after this a few more minutes were spent arguing until John finally realized he had no choice, but to do so after all as the saying goes, a happy wife is a happy home, and John wanted his happy home. As the two worked out their issues, James couldn't help but think about how irresponsible and irrational this was. Yes, we as humans know, as living beings naturally have a weak spot for children, but this was excessive, there is the chance that they may be child soldiers, who were meant to take over the planet from the inside, and as one of them. Like the Saiyans or the Viltrumites then this woman may have just single-handedly brought down humanity, but thankfully they are on the peaceful side of things. Speaking of the peaceful side of things, James wasn't so sure if even the Kryptonians were that peaceful. This assumption was made after considering the fact that the Kryptonian civilization had and wanted to continue expanding their territory. When one hears this, they wouldn't really understand what it really meant, since it doesn't sound as violent or scary as it actually is. That sentence simply meant that Krypton waged wars on every planet on every solar system they encountered around their territory. They had wiped out races, killed and pillaged on several planets across multiple solar systems, that a green lantern had to be sent to watch over them. 
James believed assuming the planet was not dying and Jor-El didn't start to notice the errors of their society, then their mission on Earth would be to conquer it from the inside, especially considering that the space pods were manufactured in mass and were meant for children. Come to think of it, Earth was marked in Krypton systems, which basically means that they were planning to conquer it too, James thought as he laid into his new mother's body a few minutes later, and after a lot of grunt work on John's part, they finally loaded the spacecraft onto the truck, and they drove off into the night. Martha's Pav John and I have been married for the last TWO2 or so years, and honestly, everything has been alright. Yes, we, like every other couple out there, have had our little quarrels, but this was much bigger than that. John says it doesn't matter much, but it matters to me. I feel like God has given me everything I could ever want in life, a happy home, sustainable income etc. But the one duty he has given me I can't fulfill. I know John is considerate and hasn't spoken much about it, but I can feel even he isn't happy about it. Well, which man would be happy knowing that their wife can't give birth? I know that this is the modern age, and this isn't exactly much of a problem now, since things like adoption and surrogate mothers care to be, but I just don't feel at ease. Thankfully I now have these little bundles of joy. I know I may have picked them up irrationally, but I don't think they are the evil aliens we see in movies. I don't think John understands, but immediately I saw them, I just had the feeling that we were meant to take care of them. John still keeps his guard around the babies though, but I think he's coming around John come and see. I called out as I dragged him from the sitting room couch to the bedroom, what? What is it he asked cluelessly, what do I expect when he just watches that damn TV all day, look. I whispered as I motioned for him to peep through the slightly open door okay what am I looking at John asked as he peeked through the space, so I joined looking inside, one could easily spot the crib lying on the floor. I know normal cribs are supposed to have legs that lift them far above ground level, but that is not needed in this house. These children, especially James, yes, I named them. He is an explorer. Clark seems more like a normal baby, but James is just something else, he is always active. Enjoys crawling around the whole building and can somehow avoid danger. Inside the room, I could now see a scene that I never expected to see in my life. This was probably the cutest thing I have seen in my life equals Pav shift John equals, is he rocking his brother to sleep? I asked shocked, this was both the most surprising thing I have ever seen, well after their space pods, but how is this even possible, which one is he again? I asked because honestly, I can't tell them apart, they are identical twins, but somehow Martha can. I don't know if this is some motherhood juju, but she is doing it, oh that's Jane she answered, like I said women, how is he doing that? I asked wait a minute, why am I even surprised, these are alien children. I shouldn't judge them with common sense. I may not know how James developed this behavior, because he has always acted like a normal baby okay not exactly a normal baby, since his actions seem to contain a hint of intellect behind them, but this behavior was too abnormal, at least using Clark as a standard. Martha you don't need to be too surprised, they are aliens, maybe their species mature faster than us I know, but Clark is not doing things like this. Maybe our environment has changed, Clark Martha suggested, but I know that it clearly wasn't that. I may not be a scientist, but I can at least tell that James is just an anomaly, after all there is no proof that he is different. I would have suggested that he was genetically modified like those people or mutants in the movies, but who would modify one twin and leave the other, especially in a situation where they look alike. James couldn't be a robot too cause why would you make a robot that looks exactly like your son? Well, who am I to talk, I know next to nothing about their race or species, so let's just hope that this is as innocent as it looks, or else we are definitely in for a tough time. A year after adoption Kent Farms. A baby that looked around the age of 2 to 3 years old, could be seen running around the house as a woman chazzed after him. The house was filled with baby laughter as the babies in the house ran around laughing. It had been more than a year since James and Clark were adopted by the Kent couple. James had grown accustomed to having them as parents, though he still felt a little apprehensive in their presence, he was now much more open and free with them. As for Clark, he thinks the couple are his actual parents, so there were no problems on his side. James and his brother, Clark ran around the house happily as they laughed. James may be a serious-minded person, but even he knew that this opportunity to be free of all responsibility only comes once, so he happily and wholeheartedly took it as he played around as his body commanded, and to his surprise, he actually enjoyed it. Okay enough play, you guys have to prepare for school, Martha said when she caught the two brothers. Nuo they both shouted in unison. They both hated school. Home was much more interesting or at least that was how it was for Clark. James didn't really care about school, he just didn't have the energy to deal with the children in the school. No you both stop it, we have discussed this, you guys are definitely going to school whether you like it or not, Martha said sternly as she grabbed the two in each arm, and left for the bedroom to dress them up hmm, I don't like school, Clark whined as he hung from her arm, don't worry dear. 
You would make some friends soon, Martha replied as she dropped the two on the floor. Okay, who wants to go play in the playground? Martha shouted, knowing her two children, me, the two shouted in reply. James may deny it all he wants, but deep down, he knew that he was changing and he was changing fast. He didn't know if it was because the Kents were just excellent moral code teachers or something like that, or it was just because he was still a baby. Most wouldn't realize how linked the physical and mental are. Babies learn at an exponentially fast rate, everything they see, they copy and learn. At that stage of one's life, they were basically like a supercomputer with 10G network, as they absorb everything they see or hear, especially for the both of them who had a naturally increasing intellect, the longer they stayed under the yellow sun. The Kents were a kindly and warm-hearted couple, while James though was kindly and warm-hearted too, years of working a dead-end job, as well as putting up with the world as an average man, had made him extremely numb to certain things. James had gotten to the extent that even if there was a murder beside him, he would ignore the entire commotion and leave after all it wasn't his business, though he may call the police later on, but helping at that moment would never cross his mind, but now under the Kent's care, all those long-forgotten morals, code of conducts. His parents had instilled in him were all reawakened. He may be a grown man, but his body was still that of a toddler, and no matter what he does, his body still accepted everything they taught it, even if he didn't like it. The past few months had been pretty normal to James, except that he had somehow learned to manipulate the surrounding gravitons to achieve flight. James didn't know how he managed to achieve this even without awakening his super senses yet, but James liked it, though he still came up with multiple theories that would explain his situation. One of them been that as Kryptonians are known to be like humans under Krypton's atmosphere, then they must have developed an anti-gravity organ or mechanism in their body that allowed them to wander freely under the harsh gravity of Krypton, so maybe due to the large amount of ambient cosmic radiation and energy that he absorbed every day. He must have somehow awakened the mechanism beforehand. The theory sounded good and all, but it wasn't so for the other Kryptonians as they all spent some time before they started flying, but Zod and his elites were known to have achieved flight just several hours after being exposed to the yellow sun, so James thought that it was probably something that your mind influences. Ever since he woke up in this body, James had dreamt of flying through the sky just like Superman does, and his body adjusted to grant him his wish. It didn't matter much to James in what sequence he awakened his powers. It mattered to him that he was awakening them even as early as now, but as a self-respecting transmigrator, James took advantage of his flight every night. His parents had accepted the fact that James could take care of Clark even at night, so they became lax in their checkups at night, so James used the time he had to fly out of the house. Since he hadn't awakened his super senses and in extension his supervision, he couldn't detect or identify radio waves and such that would allow him escape detection by the various forces of the world, so he made sure to always fly to the middle of any available ocean or sea before he leaves Earth's atmosphere. Most may not realize this, but when they say the Kryptonians can manipulate gravitons to fly, nearly everybody just ignores that fact that these people are actually using their own gravitational field to go against the gravitational field of the world and environment around them. Basically each Kryptonian who learned how to fly was also manipulating gravity, though it was personalized gravity, it was still gravity at the end of the day. They were manipulating one of the fundamental forces of nature just by learning to fly. It's even funnier that none of them has ever noticed the potential behind this little ability that allows them to fly. Yes, they could fly, but they could also use it to slow down or speed up objects within the range of their gravitational field. They could become immune to the effects of gravity on any and all planets, even Krypton, though for a limited time because of the red sun. James knowing all of this had of course tried practicing all these, coupled with the natural bioelectric aura that made him invulnerable to most things. James was practically on Superman levels of invulnerability even as just a baby. In order not to stunt his growth in any unforeseen way, James would make sure to trap as much air in his graviton bubble that allowed him to fly, then force his way into space, though not too deep into space. James made sure that he would only reach a distance a little further from the satellites, thus sensing himself to Earth's orbit. This would allow him to absorb a larger amount of cosmic radiation than while on the planet, and at the same time, prevent him from getting lost in space, should anything happen to him. The amount of radiation that James absorbed was just enough for him to become stronger quickly, without overloading him after all the Earth's electromagnetic field was still there to scatter most of the energy sent in the direction of the planet. James had done this for several months as he kept on getting stronger and stronger each day. With his ability to apparently absorb many more types of energy than just the solar energy, Kryptonians were used to. James got stronger just as fast as he learned things, or you could even say he did it faster. Most would say that James was rushing to become more powerful, but thinking about the universe, he was in then James felt it appropriate. James was getting ready for anything after all he too had read all the fanfiction light novels. 
Those main characters were supremely powerful even when they were born, but just a little time travel nonsense would ruin it all, then the author would pull some miraculous surviving route for their main characters, but James wasn't so sure that the same plot armor would work on him, his brother. Yes, but for him. He doubted it after all. Clark was the protagonist here, and he fell under Clark's loved one's category, and we all know what happens to those in that category. When the two brothers were fully dressed, Martha went on to prepare their lunchboxes as John made sure to feed them properly. The entire household worked like they were all part of one giant organism, creating a harmonized and peaceful atmosphere around the house. Minutes later, James and his brother, Clark were bouncing and playing around in the backseat of the old Kent truck. James felt like the truck had probably seen WW1. Wonder Woman was probably acquainted with the truck, it was so old yet the couple liked it very much. James didn't know if this was a sentimental thing, or just that they had no choice because they didn't have the money. Okay James, I want you to take care of your brother in school okay, I don't want your teacher calling me again, Martha said from the front seat, and James nodded, no fair, why does James have to be in charge all the time Clark whined immediately, don't worry dear, when you grow a little bit older, then you can be in charge okay. Martha said as she looked at him with these eyes that just seemed to convey a special type of emotion. Those eyes were the reason many babies had fallen victim to fraud, Clark would never be in charge. Okay mommy Clark replied, then returned to his thing meanwhile James just sat there trying to figure out how to fix a Lego toy he had broken by accident. James and Clark went to the local public school for kids their age, and through John's persuasion, they managed to stay in the same class. They had done this because they too knew that James could fly, it wasn't like he was exactly hiding it, as he sometimes hovered into the air to grab something from an upper table or hide something there. They had seen this in action with their own two eyes, so they expected Clark to one day do the same, so they made the school agree to having them both in the same classroom, so that James could help if anything wrong were to happen. After dropping them off, the couple left, leaving the two to face whatever they encountered alone. But together. James being who he was preferred to have no friends but damn. Did these children have stories to tell so Clark and James each had their own group of friends. As one one year olds, they didn't care about anything except playing which was basically all they did in school, and the occasional learning of the alphabets, but apart from that, it was all about playing. Smallville, playground. Clark and friends were playing around the playground, and Clark was it. Oh imagine the frustration when he couldn't catch anyone. Clark may have a slightly enhanced physique compared to these kids, but in reality he was only a little bit faster than they were. James didn't know the reason why Clark awakened his powers at a much slower rate. As always James tried to guess the reason as to why Clark awakened his powers slowly, but the only reason he could find was that Clark was subconsciously holding himself back because he thought himself to be human. Every other Kryptonian he could think of gained Superman-level strength and speed on their first week on Earth. Though Clark was still a kid, his level of power was really pathetic for a Kryptonian. Even J.O.N. Clark's kid had power levels greater than him when he was just a kid, so James only came to the conclusion that Clark was subconsciously reducing his own power levels to live amongst others, so his powers could only awaken slowly. The theory was made even better when you realize that kryptonine powers are somewhat psionic in nature, so it was plausible that Clark was holding himself back subconsciously. As James watched the group play around as he sat on the swing, he had his own group of friends, but he was and still is an introvert, he enjoyed staying alone, and this just happened to be the best choice he made today as a few seconds after he sat on the swing. The group he was watching started slowly losing their skins as their insides became visible to him. At first, he was freaked out by this, but since he knew what was going on, he just sat there and bore the pain, as he tried to focus solely on the group that were running around. The voices were excessive, the smells unbearable and what he saw was extremely disgusting, but he just sat there bearing it all. If little Clark could do it then a grown-ass man like him could too, and he will do it. Slowly but surely, the voices and smells started reducing as only the voices of the group could be heard, the smells were still unbearable, but he could manage it, and though he was disgusted by the insides he saw, he took solace in the fact that he knew they were alive and well. After that, James spent hours getting used to his newly enhanced senses. He could block everything out by simply creating a gravity shield around himself, but this was important, this would be the basics of a lot of his adventures in future. Enhanced senses were the basics of nearly every superhuman, and if he didn't have it then he wasn't worth being called Clark's twin. As James continued looking at them, his sight slowly started returning to normal, as the children's bones started reappearing followed by their organs, muscles and finally skin and clothes. When James saw all this, he smiled happily after all it proved he was getting the hang of it, but James didn't stop there as he tried to consciously use his new ability. James spent several minutes just viewing in and out of the people's bodies. 
He James chuckled while thinking about the fact that he was probably the only Kryptonian who was chill about their super sense. The others all screamed in pain when it appeared, but he just shook his head and handled it like a champ. Four years later Kent Farms, Barn. Inside the barn, the sounds of something scraping against the ground could be heard along with the occasional grunt, but nothing, and no one could be found inside the barn. Meanwhile, under the barn, James was busy as he shifted the various pillars holding the barn's floor from caving in. James didn't know what the original idea behind having an underground space in a barn was for, but at the moment, it held the space pod he and Clark had traveled in. The Kents may have rebuilt the barn, or they already just had this unreasonable large space even before they came. James didn't know for what reason the space was there for, but now it held the pod and had enough space for his various future experiments and other things. James approached the now dust-covered space pod with a bit of caution after all who knew what other tech Jor-El had crammed into this thing. Seeing that it was safe to approach, James started wiping the surface of the space pod to restore it back to its full glory. James spent the next 20 or so minutes carefully cleaning the space pod, and soon it was sparkly clean. Now to check this thing out, James thought to himself as he started searching for any form of activation method or on button he could find, but he found literally nothing dollar and number percent cents euros yen. Number dollar and at a strange voice suddenly came out of the pod, and immediately James backed off from the pot, as it suddenly hummed to life, and a part of it opened up to reveal a screen. The space pod now looked like a giant cylindrical pod computer which had a holographic keyboard that held strange letters, floating on its dashboard. Seeing this setup, James was shocked, but he still smiled after all, while he never expected the space pod to also double as a computer, he had just gained a computer from a super advanced civilization like Krypton. He wouldn't be surprised if someone told him that this computer could rival a quantum computer. Analyzing language and planets culture the voice continued, but this time in English as the keyboard changed to hold the normal English alphabets. Kilex online the voice said as it changed to a more normal human voice, though it held a feminine tone. Wait. Kilex? James asked surprised, he knew that Kilex was an aide to Jor-El, and that it was a staple in most Superman comics, but he had seen it get destroyed along with the planet Good Day Rao-El, how may I help you Kilex asked using a weird British accent, M Kilex please lose the accent changing accent now or no, I said lose the accent completely. Just talk with a neutral accent James said, since he had a feeling that any accent Kilex comes up with, would feel weird affirmative, Good Day Rao-El. How may I help you Kelix replied without any accents this time which was weird, but it was far much more better than when it spoke with accents, I guess. Jor-El saved a copy of you in the ship right, James asked, since he knew that nobody would send their children out into space, without having some sort of AI or being to watch over them, you are correct okay, so can you tell me how much computing power this ship has, depending on how fast it is, it will affect my plans, James said in human terms, the stealth pods. Each possess computing power a million times faster than a billion qubit quantum computer, as they are all equipped to act as a mini outpost for Krypton's forces Gilex explained, as though it was nothing, you say what? James asked as though he didn't hear it, this little thing though it was big when compared to a human, it was nothing compared to a truck, but held more computing power than anything humanity had produced. The stealth pods were created as mini outposts for Krypton's forces, as they house all a soldier needs to conquer, the planet Kilex said again, but rephrasing its words as though to explain to him better, oh, I got you the first time, so this little thing houses all someone needs to conquer a planet right, James asked with a weird smile on his face affirmative. Jor-El had removed some of them to fit in a warp drive, but most are still here Kilex replied, okay enough of that before you make me start having ideas. Anyway this thing holds the basic knowledge of Krypton right, James asked yes sir, it holds all the knowledge and some of the equipment needed to be one of Krypton's best soldiers, I don't need that, just show me everything on our biology, and also while you're at it, can you scan me, James asked, though the pod computer was unexpected, James updated his plans accordingly. Initially he just planned to use this space as a temporary base to study everything he could about himself, since it was the largest hardly visited space in the house, but since Kilex was here, he might as well extend his plans to studying everything about Krypton while he was at it. Yes sir Kilex answered a faint blue beam shot out of the pot, and swept through James' body. Seconds later, all the information about his physiology was displayed on the screen. At the moment, James was a complete idiot when it came to advanced topics like physics, biology and the likes, since the only knowledge he had on them was what he got from his past life. Things he had long forgotten leaving behind only a few facts which meant that he would have to relearn everything again, but the farm didn't provide any conducive learning facilities, and neither did the school, since it was limited to only things they would need at their age, and he wasn't old enough to suddenly leave the house for hours on end, so he could only settle for the little he knew and learn as time passes, but now, he could learn all he wanted with the help of Kilex. 
Keylex, can you scan the Earth's internet and compile all valuable information into several files that I can learn? James asked since he knew that Keylex could do it after all at the moment, all the human technological giants of this universe hadn't yet started their reign. Batman was either a five or six year old, Lex was either six or so, Mr. Terrific was probably still in middle school or so. Commencing scan Keylex replied as all the information on the screen disappeared, leaving behind a screen which showed several files, all nameless at first, before they suddenly gained a name after every subject taught in schools and more. Scan complete Keylex said as the files visibly reduced from the thousands to a hundred or less. Keylex had classified all the information under their umbrella subjects in order to make things easier for James. Seeing it complete the task handed taught it, James immediately opened the file titled, Biology, and started reading through all he could and fast. James was taking advantage of his parents' absence to do all he was doing. The Kent couple would normally never make the decision to leave a FIVE5 old behind, but James had proven that he could take care of not only himself but his brother as well on multiple occasions, so the couple didn't think much about it when they left after all, they already made sure that the actual child in the house was sound asleep. As James read and processed the massive amount of information he was gaining, he also made sure to always check up on Clark and the house's surroundings for any suspicious person or thing using his X-ray vision and thermal imaging. He didn't know why, but he had been having a strange feeling lately. He hoped it was nothing, but he found himself always preparing for an attack, no matter what time or day it is. Keylex can you set up a watch over the house, James asked I can't do that sir, I have no equipment to use Keylex replied immediately, to which James just sighed. He too knew that Keylex was an AI it would only be able to perform where there was equipment to use unlike here. All it could do is probably view the house from space, but that would just alert the world of a mystery hacker or being that could hijack satellites. Thanks anyway but Keylex can I ask you something James asked suddenly as he removed the heavy feeling he felt. Sure, go ahead okay, Keylex can you run a Ponzi scheme, James asked with a smile, he didn't know why, but the very moment Keylex appeared, he thought of how Keylex would probably the ultimate fraudster, especially with the computing power it had access to. Keylex could study human behavior and find out the best ways to manipulate humans to pay in their money. Ponzi scheme. Yes Keylex replied seconds later I knew it. But to what levels of efficiency James asked, at the moment, he wasn't ruling out the thoughts of actually starting a Ponzi scheme. Not for any real reason except for the fact that he could and he wanted to see how long Keylex could run it and that it would be fun. I can make it last for hundreds of years if you want, do you want me to start a scheme, I don't know. Yes no. In fact yes, let's test it out, James said with a smile screening all possible scenarios. Reinventing scheme calculating pair 8. Keylex said continuously though it didn't interrupt James files even while doing all that. Scheme frame built, sir please state all limits you want to put on it, now Keylex said, at the moment, James couldn't help but think about how advanced Keylex was. If it wasn't for all the respectful remarks and the fact that he knew that Keylex couldn't feel emotions yet, he would have thought he would have thought that Keylex was a regular human. Just do what is necessary as long as the scheme doesn't harm anyone too much or unnecessarily, James said after all he didn't know much about Ponzi schemes, he just knew that when the scheme collapses, it usually affects a lot of people badly. Generating capital Keylex suddenly said much to James' surprise A Keylex, what do you mean by that to run a well-planned Ponzi scheme, you would need to have a large amount of capital. I am taking all excess money from all illegal accounts I can find Keylex replied oh, thank goodness James thought. After all, if you have to put money into an illegal account then you obviously didn't get that money in the right way. Registering all required documents. Establishing website Keylex said as it worked to create what was probably the greatest Ponzi scheme in existence. If James knew what his simple experiment for fun would lead to, he wouldn't be smiling like a fool. He didn't need the money the scheme would generate. This whole ordeal was just an experiment to him, an experiment to see how much advanced Keylex really was. He knew Keylex was advanced when it came to all the technological nonsense, but he wanted to see how advanced it was as an AI, if it could understand human nature. Of course, James knew how stupid that sounded after all even humans didn't understand human nature, we just assume the dark sides and say oh that's reality for you. Humans were made to view things from a negative perspective before you go positive. It is just how we are so James wanted to see how it would be, if an artificial intelligence was trying to predict the decisions of thousands if not millions of people. Sir can I have the permission to build myself a body Keylex suddenly asked, as long as it is just a single body for yourself then no problems, but I don't want to hear or see a group of robots walking around, do you hear me? James replied without even thinking much about it. Keylex may be a super advanced AI, but it was extremely loyal to the L family bloodline affirmative Sir Keylex replied as usual, without any emotions as it continued, its unseen work THREE, months later. Under the barn. 
James had slowly turned the space around the space pod into a makeshift lab. He had already gotten permission from his parents who were utterly surprised that James had found out about the pod, but could only accept it after all the boy promised not to reveal it to Clark until the other party was ready or needed to know. Knowing the truth about their existence could affect Clark in a lot of ways, especially now that he was extremely open to outside influences. It could cause some sort of change in Clark, resulting in him not choosing to become Superman. Even though James didn't like the very idea of Superman. He knew it was a character that was absolutely needed in every DC universe. From what he knew, every universe that had its Superman killed without any means of return had all been destroyed. Power Girl's Superman died and so did the universe, Dark Multiverse has multiple dead Supermans too, and the entire multiverse is on the verge of breaking down. James wasn't planning on stopping the process of Clark becoming Superman. At the moment, James could be seen practicing a weird martial arts style with a holographic version of himself as a guide. In the past three months, James had memorized and learned everything Kelex had compiled for him. The current James was basically a walking Wikipedia, as his mind retained everything he saw with great clarity. He has done practicals of everything he learned using the holographic technology of the pod. At the moment, even without his powers, James could be said to be a master level expert in basically all styles of martial arts there was, a one-man medical team, an expert lawyer etc. All this was mostly possible because Kryptonians may not show it well or that often, but their bodies often react more to what they think. Basically their bodies obey their thoughts. Otherwise it was basically impossible as to why Superman had achieved many of his feats. He became an expert surgeon just by reading. No matter how James thought of that, it was impossible, but here he was mastering everything in existence just after a few months of reading, though he still refused to accept that fact, as he still practiced with the holographic images provided by Kelex. The current martial arts style that James was practicing was synthesized by Kelex after scanning through all existing ones. The martial arts was weird in the sense that it came in two parts. The first for when facing normal humans, the other for when facing Kryptonians or with Kryptonian-like physiques. The first allowed James to pull his punches easily, still he didn't want to obliterate the opponent in his first punch, though it still focused on striking against very vital organs and points in the body. The second targeted vital organs and spots on the body, while making sure to allow you to exhibit about 120% of your full strength after all it was designed to face superhumans in total, though mainly against other Kryptonian-like beings. Both styles could be taught to a normal human, and they would probably obliterate any body they face, since both versions of the style were like Krav Maga, in the sense that they were meant to end fights quickly, by using quick and powerful strikes against the opponent's vitals, but it was also like karate, in the sense that a single hit is meant to kill. Basically James had Kelex design a martial arts style that made it possible for a normal human to kill other humans with nothing but a single punch or kick. Of course, all of this under the condition that said person is able to learn the martial arts in the first place, since it requires an extremely strong but yet flexible body. It had an insane requirement before you start, but thankfully James easily met both requirements. During the last three months, James not only learned. He also achieved his purpose to find out exactly what was different about him compared to other Kryptonians. The experiment proved to be a great idea for James, since he learned a lot about his own physique in comparison to normal Kryptonians. James could absorb more energy because in simple terms, he was a mutant. A metacryptonian if you will. He had extra genes in his body that all other Kryptonians didn't have. Of course, James had no idea if his metagene was the same one that the future metahumans would have, but he didn't care because his metagene too was also mutated. The gene was supposed to just allow him to absorb energy, no matter the type, but due to his Kryptonian physique, it mutated or extended its reach to every other of his abilities. He couldn't use the energy he absorbed for anything other than empowering himself, but apparently now he no longer had any weaknesses. Kryptonite had no effect because he would just absorb it, and also fun fact, apparently normal Kryptonians can develop a resistance to Kryptonite if they are exposed to it for extended periods of time. This resistance can eventually evolve to become an immunity to kryptonite, but James had bypassed this 100 years or so project as his metagene also absorbed energy from kryptonites. Basically the metagene made James an extremely powerful energy converter. He is able to absorb any form of energy and convert it all into a form of energy that is used to improve his body. James earnestly couldn't help but get excited for the thought. Who's there? James suddenly asked when he noticed a sudden change in airflow and unfamiliar scent in the air. This was a small skill he developed to improve his already powerful perception. It did require much skills or training to acquire, since all he had to do was learn to be attentive, as expected from Lord Rao, a male voice said as a blonde man stepped out of the shadows. The man wore a weird black combat suit designed to hide him, but unfortunately, the amount of heat he generated was astonishing, who are you and how do you know that name? 
James asked as he prepared to kill him. James may be soft-hearted and all, but when you seem like a threat, he will remove you from the entire picture. That was his principle and no matter the amount of training, it would never change. Even as a 5, 5 year old, you are still this powerful. It seems I have my work cut out for me the man said, then suddenly vanished, though it seemed as though he had teleported out, James could clearly see that he had ran out, Eobard Thon James said, and this time, he actually prepared to kill. If before there was a chance, he planned to let this man go then now that plan had disappeared. Ha ha ha. You are really an anomaly Eobard replied. Eobard Thonaka the reverse flash, was a major flash villain who James considered more of a pest than a villain. He had absolutely no purpose. He was just there to ruin Flash's life, well your very existence would soon become an anomaly to life itself, James replied, and also sped after him. James may not be fast enough to catch up to him, but he could see him clearly and also block most of his attacks. Seeing the figure, who was running and trying to taunt him, James just smiled as he looked around the environment. He was waiting for an open space. Seconds later, they began approaching a vast field, so James immediately sped up much to Eobard's surprise, as he slammed into Eobard's back, sending him flying into the field. As Eobard flew across the field, James didn't give him any chance to rest as he attacked him, even while the other party was still in mid-air. Shit. James screamed when his fist passed through the figure before him as it faded away, you may have caught me off guard, but it will never happen again, Eobard said as he reappeared a few meters behind James oh, you would be surprised, James replied with a smile, the only problem he had with Eobard, was that he was too fast. Other than that, he had no other problems. Seeing James standing in one spot, without moving, Eobard immediately attacked, confident that James wouldn't catch him. Which was true as he threw punch after punch at James, who just took it all while standing in the same spot. I am beyond everything you would ever experience, Eobard claimed as he laughed, your stupidity is beyond my understanding all right, James thought as he suddenly grabbed the air before him, and squeezed at the same time erg. Eobard choked as he hung helplessly from James' hand. James may not be able to catch him with speed, but all speedsters had one massive flaw. They all subconsciously follow the same pattern of attack, and if you could withstand those attacks, you can catch and disable them easily holding Eobard's neck, high up in the air. James immediately started waving his hands left and right, and continuously increased the speed of the movement, until his hands seemed no different from a vibrator. Goodbye, Eobard James said, then slammed his vibrating hand into his body, grabbing hold of the man's heart and pulling it out. I wonder why you even came back here, James thought after all Eobard was extremely stupid. If he knew he was extremely powerful in the future, then why didn't he come to attack when he was still a baby, rather than now and also even when he came to attack, why didn't he wonder why his future self didn't follow to return? Time worked in a linear manner, especially since Eobard could exist in any timeline without creating any paradoxes or destroying the timeline. He should have thought of why his future self, who would definitely know about the attack on him, come back to stop Eobard. Thinking of this, James even began doubting whether he had fought a real Eobard, or if this was just a failed clone. I don't die so easily a voice suddenly said from the other side of the field. Hearing the voice, James turned to see another Eobard standing at the edge of the field. Phew. I knew it wouldn't end so easily James said, then dropped the dead body in his hand on the floor. He knew this body was real since it hadn't disappeared, even after the new Eobard appeared, which simply means that the dead Eobard either somehow sent his memories to the past, or he had truly created a clone. It didn't matter to James which it was, the fact still remained that Eobard was going to die today. Arrogant Eobard replied, then sped towards James who immediately dodged the attack, only to see blood flow out of a tiny line on his body, you like it. NTH metal, I don't even know why I didn't think of this before, Eobard said, then started laughing maniacally. NTH metal? James asked, surprised. NTH metal wasn't a metal found on Earth. It only existed on Thanagar, the home planet of Hulk Girl and her kind. The metal had the capability to negate all forms of energy and healing powers. Basically the metal negated everything. From gravity to magic and on that list was the bioelectric aura that protected powered Kryptonians. Meaning the metal could actually affect Kryptonians even at their strongest, but it was extremely rare on Earth, so James didn't know where Eobard got. Scratch that. When Eobard got it and even shaped it into a glove. This is what Hawkwoman refused to share with the world, Eobard said in amazement as he admired the blood on the glove. It doesn't matter then, you are still going to die James said, then became even more serious after all now his life was actually in danger. Before his body could absorb any sort of energy Eobard threw at him, a punch's kinetic energy was absorbed, and when he tried to phase through James' body, he would absorb the speed force around him, so James was never really in danger before, but now. 
Things just became serious as NTH Metal was not a metal to play with, as it carried multiple abilities beyond his capabilities of handling, and James hoped that Eobard didn't know of all of those uses. Becoming much more serious, James immediately took off after him as Eobard 2 came after him with the two meeting themselves in the middle of the field. As they met the two immediately began exchanging blows as Eobard used his years of experience to fight, while James used his gained knowledge to adapt, as he blocked nearly all of Eobard's blows, both sides healing as they got injured. As the fight continued, James started becoming more and more lax with his control, as he began using his new martial arts style against Eobard. With each strike, James blocked, Eobard suffered a broken hand along with a blown out chest, as James started adapting to his mind-boggling speed or in better terms, he absorbed more of the negative speed force energy, Eobard released, and transformed them into normal energy which improved his prowess. They exchanged multiple blows in just a second with James suffering less and less injuries as time went on. James' physique offered him the absolute advantage over Eobard, as he could tank most of his punches, and at the same time, heal from any injury gained in the process, while Eobard could only heal his body as he was damaged which was increasing by the minutes. James, now capable of seeing the now tiring Eobard clearly, activated his gravitational field as he attracted Eobard towards himself. He couldn't use it previously because he believed that Eobard would definitely know of it and would be able to outrun his range, but now that their speed was on par, concerns of that sort were thrown out of the window. Activating the field, Eobard flew uncontrollably towards James who immediately gathered all his strength and slammed his fist into Eobard's body, resulting in blood splattering everywhere. Finally James thought as he picked up the glove Eobard was holding. James didn't know if Eobard had sent his memories back in time or not after all, comic book characters were all ridiculous. James didn't know how Eobard did it earlier, so he guessed that he must have sent his memories to a younger version of himself, which honestly sounded like something out of a comic book, but in this universe it was possible. Looking around the field, James saw all the carnage he had caused in sight, I guess, he wouldn't be coming back anytime soon, James thought after all who wants to continue coming to their death, despite knowing how it happens. Eobard wasn't that stupid so James could easily tell that he would be free from any time travel nonsense for now. Looking at his body, James was immediately disgusted, so he hovered up into the air and immediately shot for the skies as he flew into space. The very speed at which he was traveling burned off his clothes, along with any form of dirt or traces of blood on his body. He could have chosen to just return home and bathe, but that wouldn't work for someone with an enhanced sense of smell like Clark, but when he burnt it all up and was smelling like burnt toast, then nobody would notice. Though his durability made it impossible for his body to be harmed by this type of heat, it doesn't mean that the faint smell of burnt meat wouldn't remain. As James flew out of the planet's atmosphere, he immediately headed for Venus as he thought of how he had just killed a man. Yes, Eobard was an extremely stupid man and one who was bent on killing him, but he was still a living being at the end of the day. Funny enough, he hadn't felt anything when he had done so. James didn't know the reason for this apathetic behavior, but the main reason he could think of was that he still thought of most people as comic book characters. As James thought of his current situation, he smashed into an extremely dark but yet extremely hot planet. Standing up and waking up from his thoughts, James looked around in surprise, he didn't know when or how he got here so fast. Since when was I this fast James thought to himself as he hovered off the face of the planet and turned to see the massive ball of plasma that towered over him. James had somehow flown from Earth to Mercury in just a few minutes. This very fact blew James' mind after all he normally spent about 20 minutes to get from Earth to Venus, but he'd just gone from Earth to Mercury in the same amount of time. Hmm, update metagene increases specific traits according to the type of energy it absorbs James mentally noted, since this meant that while his metagene absorbs all forms of energy and converts them into a form of energy that his mutated cells accepted. Specific types of energy affect certain traits for example negative speed force energy improved his body, but it focused more on his speed or agility, and whatever it was that controlled his flight. As James stood there, he felt his body absorbing massive amounts of energy, to the extent that James felt as though if he stayed any longer, he would explode. Of course this was not true, since his metagene could absorb and convert a limitless amount of energy, and Kryptonians could process massive amounts of energy, and use the energy to strengthen themselves, but James felt extremely full, so he immediately took off for Earth with a massive smile on his face. Arriving back at the farm, James immediately started cleaning up everything that had been disarranged while he was chasing Eobard. He didn't want his family to know and they probably wouldn't, but then there was Clark who could see through walls and had telescopic vision. James didn't know if Clark had seen him or not, but it honestly didn't matter to him because he knew that the real fight had occurred out of Clark's current range. Kelex can you help me to analyze this, James said as he returned to his makeshift lab. 
The place was slowly turning out into a really lab, as more and more equipments were moved into the space okay Sir Kelex replied as usual in its emotionless tone. James placed a glove on one of the equipment in the space, as the AI scanned it thoroughly. Sir the materials used in making this are beyond my current capabilities, but it is easy to tell that it was made using two different metals. One being regular steel found on earth and the other being an unknown metal that I can't get a good reading of Kelex replied steel huh? So it isn't pure NTH metal, then James thought, he wasn't surprised that Kelex wouldn't be able to identify the metal or even be able to scan to do so in any way, since NTH metal isn't exactly something anyone understands. Even the Thanagarians who had a decent understanding of the metal didn't understand it fully well. That Thanagarian villain Cypher whatever his last name was, understood the metal extremely well to the extent that he was able to gain godlike powers, as he made a body of NTH metal for himself. NTH metal was a type of metal just a little bit less powerful than the metal of creation. Element X. Both metals have the same qualities, but Element X is just built different in the sense that everything you do with the metal is blown out of proportion. Make a computer with it and boom, you have a cosmic computer which can do basically everything, and knows all Occam author boxes. Make an armor with it and boom you're a god who can manipulate reality to your will. NTH metal is the same, but in lesser proportions though can become just as powerful if close to the source. NTH metal is able to warp reality, create god computers and all that nonsense, but that is only under the condition that it is exposed to energy from a source. Basically NTH metal is just element X that needs extra energy. James, knowing this, started creating plans to not only acquire more of the metal, but also to create miracles with it. NTH metal just like Element X could bond to a user and bend to that user's will, and it didn't matter the amount that was bonded to said person. Thanagarian didn't become supremely powerful in the universe because even they didn't have the metal in abundance, though it could only be found on their planet. They didn't truly understand the metal they had as they only knew of its basic abilities like negating gravity, healing, life support etc. They didn't know about the fact that abundance didn't matter to this metal. Just the act of bonding with it can let the user expand the metal to any length, width or size. Basically this was a metal that ignored all laws, and just did what it liked, though that was if it was allowed access to the source. The Thanagarians didn't know of this fact which was proven by the fact that they always mixed a metal with a different substance. Or it was because they once knew about its properties, but it was used for unspeakable evil, so they started the practice of mixing it with other metals. Either way, it didn't matter to James since the planet is long gone. Kelex would melting and refining the metal separate it from the steel James asked after all NTH metal doesn't really have a melting point, but steel does, and if the glove should be heated up. The steel should melt right off. No sir, that would remove some of the steel, but not all Kelex replied, well doesn't matter, I have a lot of time ahead of me, James said after all there was no need to rush. He was already powerful enough to demolish one of the most powerful men in the universe, and he was only 5 years old. NTH metal may give him extra powers and protection, but it wasn't needed. He and Kelex would probably find some way to separate the two metals in future, leaving behind pure NTH metal, which would then be used in any way he liked. Speaking of Kelex, James hadn't seen the body, Kelex created, but from the pictures he had seen. He could tell that it was definitely human looking. James didn't know if the body was fully human or not, but he wasn't worried after all the body looked exactly like a human. At least enough to fool everyone but unfortunately for Earthlings, Kelex built it based on Kryptonian physiology, meaning the body was far stronger and more durable than anything humanity has dealt with. James didn't know exactly how powerful the body was, but he knew that it was probably on par with the Eradicator or less. As for the scheme, Kelex was supposed to run. Let's just say he failed and succeeded at the same time. In basic terms, Kelex didn't design a Ponzi scheme. The little bastard created a massive company. Yes, he still took money from the people, but they all gained even more than he did so it wasn't really a scheme though due to the sheer size of the amount of people involved in the scheme, Kelex and an extension, James was now 18 billion dollars richer. Of course, James didn't know what to do with the money, so he just left it to Kelex to use it to continue funding his scheme 10 years later the Kent house. The entire Kent family was standing in the barn with the parents at the back watching the two FIFTEN 15 year old who were standing in front. James looked at his brother who had an extremely nervous look on his face and smiled. You ready? James asked as he rubbed his brother's back to comfort him, how can I be? I'm not human, Clark replied with an expression that showed his mental state extremely well. He was heartbroken, James didn't know exactly how Clark felt, but he could at least tell that the boy didn't want to hear that he was an alien true, but I can swear on my life to all the gods of this universe, that you are the most human out of all of us standing here James said, why do you have this weird way of just making me feel better, I'm your older brother dumbass. 
I literally watched you grow up yeah. He actually did Martha added in as she and John laughed really? Okay enough of that, thought I have to warn you, the place doesn't look all that clean as it's supposed to be, I have been extremely busy over the last few years, so expect everything. Oh and also, don't touch anything. James warned James, what did you do? John asked as the atmosphere suddenly became serious, James pretended as though he didn't hear him as he opened the hatch to the underground space, and they all climbed down. Arriving in the space proper, the family was faced with a full-blown sci-fi looking lab with multiple unrecognizable equipment located here and there. James, what were you doing here? Martha asked in surprise experiments, but all this isn't that important, Kelex James called out, answer me kid, what type of experiments are you? John asked in anger, but stopped when he noticed a holographic projection of a man that looked like an older version of James, some of the equipments here look dangerous, and in his mind, James could probably hurt himself in here hello sir Kelex answered whoa. Martha and Clark shouted in surprise and awe when they saw it, but John had a feeling he had seen the face somewhere else I know right, Clark meet Kelex, an artificial intelligence created by our father, Jor-El to monitor and take care of the family, but with our planet's destruction and his is inevitable death, Jor-El placed him in our pod and sent us away, James said in introduction hello Kal-El. It is nice to meet you Kelex said politely and bowed. This led to an awkward silence since none of them knew who Kal-El was thus had started looking around Clark that's you, James reminded oh. Nice to meet you then Clark replied awkwardly good day to you sir and madam, and the house of L may have been reduced to just Master Rao and Master Cal, you both still have our thanks for raising them. Master jor -El and Lady Lara would have loved to say his thanks personally, but the computer on board this pod cannot handle a memory intelligence, Kelex said, in a manner reminiscent of a butler wait. Kelex? Yes? You have had mother's memory file for all these years, and you didn't say anything, James asked you didn't ask, you only asked for your father's Kelex said, that's because I thought he would have uploaded only his mind to the pod. You didn't think to inform me that you were literally holding on to my mother I'm sorry about the blunder, but you should know that no loving father is dumb enough to think that only his opinion is needed in the growth of his child. An awkward silence ensured as the Kents nodded their heads in agreement don't worry, it isn't as if the file would have worked anyway, James what's going on Martha asked in confusion, you see, Clark and I come from a planet that harbors a technologically advanced race, Krypton. On Krypton, magic and science are one and the same because they have mastered science to its near extremes. When the planet was about to be blown up, I saw our father upload his mind into what is called a command key, James explained, and picked up the command key that contained Jor-El's memories, so, in doing so, he can live with his children, but I didn't care to talk to him because well I just don't care about him, neither do I care that much about his people, but for our mother, I cared even though it was just a little. Now Kelex is saying that both our parents would have liked to thank you, but unfortunately the pod's computers weren't equipped to handle memory intelligence or in simpler terms, A is that harbor memories, oh that's good then, you both can talk to your parents, John said with a smile, the innocent man didn't mean it in that manner, but due to his wrong timing. Everything just seemed wrong, does that mean you guys would stop taking care of us Clark asked, of course, not dear, we would forever remain your parents, we would take care of you and your brother for as long as we can, but it is also important that you at least get to know your biological parents, John answered, don't worry dear. We are still here for the both of you Martha joined in and hugged Clark to calm him down. Okay okay, enough of the sentimental stuff, you guys are ruining my lab, James said with a laugh idiot. John said and knocked his head with his fist as the entire family laughed, wait James, you've known for how long exactly Clark asked, from the very moment, we were born, I don't forget things, James replied, giving a plausible explanation, thank you Clark replied, then stretched his hand out for a handshake, look at this boy, we are brothers. We were meant to look out for each other, and I will continue looking out for you until the end of time literally James said, then hugged him all. James heard Martha say in a soft tone and immediately broke the hug, okay now, leave my lab, it's still my property boy, and also what are some of these, how and where did you get all of these from John asked, we bought them, Kelex runs a company James replied, oh wait, that's where I know you from, you are the owner of Rao Enterprises indirectly. Yes but Kelex is the legal founder of the company, the founder of Rao Enterprises is said to be worth billions of dollars. James exactly how rich are you Clark asked in surprise, he may have not paid that much attention to it, but he still had a very powerful memory, so even if they had mentioned it on the news once, he clearly remembered it. Kelex? James asked looking at the hologram, he had long since lost count of how much the company was worth, and how much they made. The company was like Wayne Enterprises that deals with everything from entertainment to technology, but unlike Wayne Enterprises, which is mostly America-based and hadn't stretched its hands past Europe. Rao Enterprises had a branch in every country of the world making people's lives better. 
Sir the company makes $20 billion in a year, most which are put back into the company for the payment of staff and funding of new projects, like the Rao Schools project. Wow, that's a lot, and we will talk about the projects later James asked. He may have lost count on how much they gain, but he was still very much updated on the company activities. He had initiated the Rao projects for a whole different reason than what was expected. The Rao projects was created so the Trao Enterprise employees would pitch in any idea they have directly to the boss himself, Aka Kilex. If Kilex deems your project reasonable, then he would fund it, and the Rao schools was one of those ideas. The entire school system was developed by the creative employees, and a lot of them had come up with a lot of crazy methods for the school to run. Well primary and secondary level of education would remain mostly the same, but the Rao universities was where everything changed, some employees had suggested that we invent a device that implants knowledge into people's mind, so in your first year of the school. You get implanted with all the knowledge required for your course, then the remaining years would be spent with other fellow students teaching each other, and mostly trying to complete the tasks given. It was crazy and James loved it. This was basically a fantasy world, anything was possible, and Kilex despite already having the technology to do just as they described, didn't just outright give it out under the command of James, instead had given them some basic blueprints that would help them invent said machine, or at least give them an idea of what they were aiming for. Projects like this led to Rao Enterprises being packed full by many crazy scientists like Professor Ivo, T.O. Moro, because they felt our moral compass was more lax than other, though they all have safety guidelines to follow. Unlike what was common in normal comics, James didn't send any of these crazy scientists out of the company instead like every sensible person, they were sent for therapy, and if it's starting to look like said person isn't improving, then James can just order Kilex to speak to said person to normalize him a bit. Of course that was one of the methods James used to control their homicidal intent. To curb any stupid behavior of kidnapping and performing live experiments, James introduced synthetic cells to the world. These guys were able to create synthetic materials and robots that feel almost human, but no one thought of creating synthetic cells. Anyway forcing the various scientists to perfect the technology, synthetic humans were born and introduced to the world. Synthetic humans were lifeless husks, the body was alive in terms that its heart was still beating, and all if you wanted, but it had no consciousness. They were introduced to the public and now used in teaching hospitals everywhere as live subjects for the learning medical practitioners, they are used in the company for the scientists to run wild with and not commit any crime. What? They all shouted in shock, the family wasn't exactly poor, but they were a middle class family whose highest income on the best day wouldn't even reach a million, but here they were hearing that their son had a net worth of more than 200 and something billion dollars. I know but the only amount that actually enters my private account is no more than $200,000, the rest is put into the company or is just assets owned by the company James said to calm them down before everyone goes crazy, that's still a lot Clark replied, no wonder people say that the company is crazy, look at the person behind it, John said as he shrugged, he felt like it was normal. James had been abnormal since they picked him up. He never cried unnecessarily, he looked after his brother, and even cradled him at times when they were still babies, he potty trained himself the moment he started walking. Learned to speak in full sentences within weeks. The boy was just something else and looked like he always knew what he was doing. Okay I need to leave here before you give me a heart attack, Martha said with a wide smile on her face, but she did turn to leave with Clark following behind her, I don't know how you are able to do all this, but boy, you are something else, I have a feeling you would achieve more than this. I just want to make sure that none of this gets to your head, John said as he placed his hand on James' shoulder, if I ever let that happen, then I have failed not only you but everyone in existence, James replied with a smile, but in his eyes, John could see that the boy was headstrong and had a goal. Good now clean this place up before you do something that causes an explosion, you have the money go rent a lab or something, John said instantly turning the once serious atmosphere around boo. That makes more sense, why didn't I think of that James said, slapping his forehead, he had never really thought of how dangerous it was to have his lab under the barn, and so close to the house, and without any sort of protective measures in place. Yes, he was confident in protecting the house from any enemy, unless the person could warp reality or manipulate matter, but he couldn't protect it, if it was an explosion from his own lab, it would be unexpected and quick, meaning that before he would even react, things would have happened. Oh wait, help me give Clark and mom this, this one's for you, James said as he super sped to a part of the lab and returned just as fast, but this time with three small boxes. What are these John asked, a watch for you and Clark and a necklace for mom, it would allow Kilex to always know your whereabouts and be able to notify us when you need help, and also it's nice, James answered as he opened one of the boxes and inside was a stylish watch, though it didn't look all that special why. 
Are you expecting some sort of being to attack us or something John asked as a joke, it's just to be sure, James replied as he handed the boxes to him, where are you going? John asked suspiciously, to find a place to go put all of this, it may take a while, but I should be back in latest tomorrow morning, normally I would be worried, but you are James, just make sure to tell your mother okay? Sure that's good, see you Kelex John said as he turned around and left the space. Kelex, help me search for any Kryptonian distress signal around the earth, James said as soon as John left affirmative Sir Kelex replied Sir, I have found nothing, but I have found two odd entries in my database go on. Several hundred years ago, a ship was sent here, it sent back a signal to Krypton coming from a place that should now be the Arctic, and prior to that, a distress signal was received from this planet in an area that would be today's Texas focus on the Texas bit, show me the exact or approximate location. I will find it myself James said as he stopped what he was doing the ship that was under Texas was probably the most powerful ship Krypton has ever produced. A sunstone ship, to understand just how powerful this ship is, you would have to understand how powerful sunstone is. This is a metal-like crystal that is capable of practically anything. Well not anything but it is a programmable crystal thus can be used to achieve most things. The command keys were made from this though not entirely sunstone, but it does contain a piece of it. The ship was made entirely of sunstone, meaning the spaceship could become anything he wanted, but that wasn't all. The spaceship was created during Krypton Zero of expansion, and was considered to be the greatest ship ever created, it was led by the greatest soldier the Krypton Empire had to offer, Admiral Zod. The Zod family are militaristic, meaning the ship was a warship which also means that it holds incredibly powerful weapons on board. Weapons capable of planetary destruction with just a single blast, the ship was powerful, and according to comics, Lex finds it, but in this life well. Lex will find it if this universe goes like that, but he definitely wouldn't live to spread the news. Receiving a GPS locator from Keylex, James immediately sped out of the space and straight for Texas. Over the past 10 years, James had bathed around and inside the sun on multiple occasions. With his mutation that allows him to absorb energy even more efficiently than normal Kryptonians as well as store energy infinitely, James became bolder in his sun trips. He took his time migrating closer and closer to the sun, so he doesn't overload himself with energy, but as of THREE 3 years ago, James officially started taking sun dips, hour-long sun dips. An hour may seem like nothing, but for a mutant or metal like him, an hour was enough for him to quadruple his already ridiculous power. At present, James could fly way faster than the speed of sound, nearly reaching the speed of light, but limits it as he was in the Earth atmosphere, but outside it, James was several times faster than the speed of light. Reaching the sun in just a few secs, it takes light EIGHT8 full minutes to get from the sun to the Earth. As for his strength, James had been experimenting with the lot. As reckoned a long time ago, Kryptonian strength is a result of conscious acts on the energy field around them. James had finally seen it, apparently when a Kryptonian reaches a certain level of power, all the energy they absorb is then stored in some matrix used to augment their bioelectric field, thus granting them impossible strength, but James wasn't a normal Kryptonian. He wanted his base strength to be way more than even that of Superman 1 million who was born under a super sun. Using his ability to consciously manipulate where his energy is being sent. James continued channeling the energy he gained to his muscles which initially got bloated, but his mutation also had a similar function to boost his physical abilities, thus he returned to normal, as his mutation processed the energy in seconds. At the moment without his bioelectric field, James could lift as much as 100 tons with absolute ease, and with his bioelectric field, then things just get ridiculous. As James hovered into the air above the farm, he immediately shot towards Texas which in turn created a massive sonic boom, indicating that James had just broken the sound barrier. James was ridiculously powerful and didn't plan to stop acquiring more power anytime soon, after all Superman may be ridiculously powerful, but he was nothing in front of certain beings. James knew this, and he believed that until he became a reality warper, then he wasn't powerful enough. Unknown location, military base. A set of large and powerful computers that looked way beyond their time, could be seen in use in a large room, as several officers and soldiers could be seen moving around the room as they went about their day. On the large screen was a map and a red dot moving across the screen. Sir, it has appeared again and it's traveling towards West Texas fast. Very fast, have you identified its origin? An officer standing a little bit behind him asked no sir, but according to its trajectory, it should be coming from somewhere in Kansas or beyond, send in Wraith, whatever that being is. I don't like it being on American soil the officer said. 
Sir, Wraith is already on his way. Intersection in T10 seconds the soldier announced as everyone looked up to screen to see a new dot rushing towards the original one at blinding speeds. Patch me through to Wraith. The officer ordered communications underway sir. One of the many soldiers on the deck said communications established sir. The soldier said again. Hello Wraith. This is General Pat. Do you have eyes of the target the officer or now general asked no sir i can't see anyone out here are you guys sure that you gave me the right location an extremely deep and weird sounding voice came from a communicator sir the target just disappeared what wraith whatever that thing is it is definitely close to you find it and bring it in the general replied a little bit confused arriving in texas's airspace james immediately took out the locator given to him as he started searching around for the crash site Sir you have an unknown incoming, and it seems to be heading directly towards you Kilex suddenly said, what? James asked confused, there shouldn't be anybody flying around at this time unless it was a magic user, then it was understandable Kilex, cloak James commanded as some sort of liquid slowly flowed out of his clothes, covering his whole body, his head included, but it didn't cover his face. The liquid solidified the instant it finished spreading to form some sort of extremely flexible metallic clothing. Anyone who knew their stuff would instantly recognize it. After the fight with Eobard, James had taken a few extra steps to protect himself, which included creating a suit of armor that he could wear at all times. The armor was made using nanotech and was made using an alloy of NTH metal. Using the resources and technology available to him, James had long since figured out NTH metal, and though he couldn't exactly get more of it, he could create an alloy of the metal that had the basic abilities of the original. The alloy named Valorium 1 after the one that will eventually be created by Brainiac 5 of the future, had incredible durability, flexibility and like the original, it still negated gravity and helped in healing, though James wasn't so sure about the magic part of things. James being who he was, used the metal to craft a set of self-replicating nanobits and boom. A suit was created. The suit didn't help much other than grant its user extreme protection against extreme natural forces like cold, heat and its enhanced durability, but it did come with a few additional features that James had put in, and one of them was an invisibility device. Calling it a cloaking device was an understatement as it helped James completely disappear from view, no matter how you were looking for him or what spectrum you were using, you wouldn't find him. Unless said person is using magic, but that would be under the condition that his new alloy wasn't immune to magic. As James entered the camouflage mode, he saw something flying towards him at full speed. As the being got closer, the clearer James saw it. It was a massive gray humanoid creature with multiple energy lines flowing through his body, as though energy flowed through its veins. Looking at the creature, James' expression immediately darkened Sir I can't see anyone out here, are you guys sure you gave me the right location? The creature asked as it held its ear. Kelex I want this area to disappear from the map. Block off every form of communication to this location, James said affirmative Kelex replied, and James revealed himself to the creature, why are you following me Wraith James asked, but unlike before his face and voice were now fully masked, Wraith was an alien from a race that was a little bit like the Kryptonians. They had powers that were derived from the sun as well, just stronger than the Kryptonians. Wraith was an alien that worked for the US government, but in disguise, he was also an alien sent here to conquer the earth from within. Basically the race brainwashed him and sent him here to set up the grounds for them. James didn't like either of the two origins, he didn't care about any government in the world, be it the American, Asian or British, they could all go to hell. He didn't care, he only cared that the earth was safe and his family was. Yes, he would eventually have to save the earth from the villains at some point, but James knew for sure that if he would ever have to take action, then it would be because it was directly related to him, or it was a dark seed level threat, but for doing what his brother would eventually start doing, James wasn't about to start any of that, and Wraith's presence could only mean one thing. That the US government knew about him. James wasn't going to let them continue spying on him. He was careless if there was anything that James knew about worlds like this, it was that if you are hesitant then it would cost you a lot, and James didn't hope to lose anything at all. Wraith was powerful, but unfortunately he met a man whose strength, speed and power were completely immeasurable. How do you know that name I know everything boy, from your race to their plans, from your presence here to the idiot in your ear James said, his modified voice making him sound much older than he was, and with his build that just was inappropriate for a 15 year old, could easily fool anyone. What do you know about my people? Well it doesn't matter, I have orders to detain you, so you either surrender or we do this the hard way Wraith commented, his pride was just something else sir I have isolated this area Kelex said, and James nodded but to confirm, he used his supervision to check around, only to confirm that all forms of man-made electromagnetic or radio waves had disappeared from the area, make me if you can. I would enjoy dissecting you to learn a little more about your species, James said in an extremely dark tone, and a large smile formed on his face. He really meant it. 
It was written in Wiki that Wraith could absorb 20 gigawatts of solar energy more than Superman. That was a lot, and also this was when you consider the fact that due to his birth process and all the other shenanigans that came after, Clark was primed to be the best Kryptonian genetically, but even then Wraith was absorbing a lot more energy than he was, Superman could absorb 140 gigawatts per minute, while Wraith was absorbing 160 gigawatts per minute. That was a lot and considering that he has been on Earth for a little more than 40 years now, this guy should be powerful, and James wanted to find out how his genetics allowed him to do that. I thought you know everything Wraith replied then charged at James ready to send him flying with a punch, there is no shame in learning more, James replied, then stretched out his palm stopping Wraith dead in his tracks. The worst mistake the machine could ever make was sending you after me, we may have talked, but I just don't like you, James replied, and immediately went into battle mode as a short sword formed on his hand. The sword was extremely short that it looked more like a spiked glove that covered his fist than a sword catching Wraith's punch in mid-air, James squeezed his fist, thus breaking most of his fingers, and at the same time, James immediately slashed down with his right hand, cutting Wraith's forearm off his body. James didn't give him any time to breath, he immediately went for the neck, but Wraith dodged only to get yanked towards James by an unknown force. In seconds, Wraith no longer had his head attached to his body as James chopped his body into pieces. Sir a team of fighter jets are headed your way Keelex notified, no problems, have you found the ship yes sir good, direct me to it, James said as he scooped up some samples from important pieces of Wraith's body like his heart, his head and maybe an arm or a leg as he left, the rest were left to sink to the bottom of the ocean, where the sun doesn't shine by the time. The fighter jets reached there. James was long gone as he was already at his destination. Killing Wraith may have not been necessary, but Wraith has been depicted to be extremely vengeful, meaning that if he was left alive, he would come again and again until he eventually loses something, but with his death, James had lost nothing instead he had gained something. The US government will now consider him a threat, and would most likely not try anything stupid against him. Comics may protray governments as headstrong people who do not know when to stop, but unfortunately this was now reality. When your unstoppable force is suddenly stopped, you don't go trying to attack the new unstoppable force, you try to understand what it's after, and maybe find a weakness, and if you eventually do then attack, but unfortunately James didn't have any of that. He was completely immune to kryptonite well at least the colors he had found, green, black and red. As for magic, everyone was weak to magic. It wasn't a weakness per se, but since he could absorb all sorts of energy, then he may develop magical resistance in the future. Currently James was standing in a huge cavity in the earth, and directly in front of the greatest invention Krypton has ever made. He found it funny how this ship was more than a thousand years old, but yet, it still carries the title of the greatest creation in Krypton's history. For James, he believed the Eradicator was the greatest accomplishment the Kryptonians could ever make. A being that can manipulate genetic traits without even touching you well, that is if you remove the fact that it was created to destroy all clones and impure Kryptonians, or at least it evolved to do the last bit. James approached the ship and in simple words, it was magnificent. It was large, well designed and still looked okay despite being thousands of meters under the earth's surface, the place was dark, but James could see clearly and could see that despite the ship supporting all the weight of the soil above it, it wasn't dented in any way. As James approached it or more accurately, stepped on the floors of the ship, a panel opened showing a fingerprint scanner, so James placed his palm on it. As he did so and waited, he felt a prick on his finger which honestly surprised him. He was extremely durable even without his bioelectric field or aura, but somehow this thing's mechanism was able to puncture his skin. James immediately removed this from his mind as only a fool would believe that ancient Kryptonians didn't know how powerful they would be under a yellow sun, so it shouldn't be strange to see them develop technology that can harm themselves. As soon as the ship collected a sample of his DNA, its doors opened and he walked into a sparkly clean environment which was abnormal compared to what he originally thought. The ship had been here for thousands of years, so it surely shouldn't be this clean. Identification process complete, DNA registered to the House of El Welcome to the Doomsday, Warlord-class ship. Please proceed to the main control room, a female voice said out of nowhere, this didn't startle James as much as it should, since he kinda expected it. The ship was clean meaning that something was doing the cleaning, and no Kryptonian would have lived this long without access to yellow sunlight. Admiral Zod and his men would have long since died, which leaves the only option to whom was doing the cleaning, an AI. What happened here, James asked as he walked towards the main control room under the guidance of the lights which turned on showing him the right places to go Admiral Zod, and his men were assassinated during a battle by the opponent, and they turned off the ship. Making it fall into this planet. Over the years, I managed to bring the ship back online, but we had no means of communication back to Krypton, as it requires the permission of the Admiral of the fleet the AI narrated well, that's useless now, Krypton is long gone. 
Now how do I assume control of the ship? James said as he arrived at the control room. It was a large space with some sort of platform that had railings guarding it. It looked like a place where someone had to rest his hands, and above it was a throne. Admiral Zod really liked to travel in style. Please place your hand on the open panel the AI set as a panel opened up on the dashboard like equipment in the room James just did as he was told, and the panel scanned his hand, and immediately after the entire ship silently hummed to life, as the lights started to turn on one after the other. Seeing this magnificent display, James was mind blown but got over it. Requesting permission to contact Krypton the AI said suddenly, you don't believe me, sure go ahead, James said without much thinking. If the AI didn't believe him then that was its problem. James didn't really care what the AI did, he was just amazed at how advanced it was, but didn't think much of it after all this was a warlordless ship, the only one of its kind. They would surely equip it with the best of the best, meaning that this AI was probably the best that Krypton could offer then and probably even now, considering that Kryptonians had long since figured out immortality. Contact failed, Krypton is no more according to Sector 14b of the Kryptonian law book. You are now granted council level authority over Krypton your words or law as you try to restore your race, the AI suddenly said without even missing a beat, James just stood there completely flabbergasted, he never knew this was an option. Though it did make sense considering that while Kryptonians didn't really believe that they would one day go extinct after all, they are the mightiest mortal race the universe has to offer, but this sort of law would still be added either just for necessity or as a joke after all who knew what would happen. To the AI, James was the last Kryptonian alive which wasn't true since Clark was still there, and the many Kryptonians in the Phantom Zone, but those locked in the Phantom Zone are all criminals, and Clark was well Clark, the AI didn't know about Clark's existence. What exactly does that mean it means that you should restore your race, son of L, and until you do so, you are Krypton and Krypton is you, so meaning I have access to everything on the ship right, James asked yes, please report to the medical room for genetic optimization, and knowledge implants sir the AI said, I don't need the optimization thank you, my father already did that. Now let's talk about the implants, how exactly do you plan on doing that, James asked in excitement. He didn't need the genetic optimization after all he was already the very best, Krypton has to offer with the codex in his genes, and who knew if the optimization process doesn't end up removing his mutation, but for the knowledge implants. James was very much interested to see what sort of technology was used here. Kilex already had a similar technology, but James just wanted to know the difference. The ship contains all knowledge gathered by Krypton soldiers during the war. It contains knowledge from 28 different galaxies, as the ruler of Krypton, you are required to be knowledgeable in everything. The council is made up of people who are the best in their fields, but it exists no more, and you are the only councilman alive, so you embody the entire council the AI said, so basically since the council doesn't exist anymore, I become the entire council, and I have to know nearly everything right, James asked affirmative okay then James set and walked towards the throne. It looked to be the main controls of this entire ship. Shut down AI James said as he pulled out a wire from his body and plugged it into the throne. AI deactivated a more mechanical voice said, and James immediately uploaded Kelex into the ship's systems. The previous AI was powerful, but unfortunately, James didn't need something he couldn't trust, and also the AI seemed suspicious to James, so as soon as he uploaded Kelex. He started the process of deleting the previous AI from the systems, he didn't have to worry about it hiding on the internet, because the world's networking systems weren't that strong enough yet to reach this deep into the earth, so the AI had no means of reaching into it. Kelex, find and destroy any remaining pieces of that AI affirmative Sir Kelex replied from the ship's audio systems. Good now scan the ship and tell me the things you find James said, sir this is a warship, it mostly contains weapons, armor and medical equipment makes sense, now how about the 28 different galaxy knowledge something the AI was talking about sir, it really is here stored in a matrix of sunstone crystals called the knowledge matrix hearing this, James was confused. The fortress of fortitude should have this not this ship. The knowledge was something the scout ship which Clark was supposed to find later in life, but it was here on the doomsday ship. James didn't know why it was here, but just went on with it, since he didn't want to give himself a headache. Okay then Kelex, I want to redesign the ship, can you do that? James asked yes sir, good scan the surroundings of this ship, I want to know how much space we have around us, and also help me modify the ship, according to the specs I provide okay? Yes sir Kelex replied and went on doing his thing as a holographic screen appeared in front of James, and he started designing the base he wanted. With James and Kelex working together, the base was soon designed and programmed into the Sunstone ship. Please stand by for transformation Kelex said as James hovered into the air in case the Sunstone had the effect of absorbing matter to expand or something of similar nature. As James hovered, he watched as the space within the ship expanded massively and stretched out as it occupied all the space within the ship's crash site. 
This caused some shaking as the ship broke and replaced all the natural pillars that held up the earth. A few minutes later, the expansion was completed, and the interior of the ship was completely unrecognizable as it had completely changed. It still retained its functions as a ship, but now it had a lot more room for other things, and was no longer military-based. On top of that Keelex also used the chance to update some of the equipment inside the ship. The ship may be Krypton's greatest achievement, but Krypton has come a long way since the ship was created and lost. Wow, James said in awe. Sunstone was on a whole different level, it is still amazing no matter how many times I see it, a new voice suddenly set out of nowhere, and James immediately got into a battle stance. He may have let his guard down ever since he came down here, but this was absolutely ridiculous. He was thousands of meters into the Earth's crust, very few people could get this location talk more of actually surviving at this location, and on top of that, whoever this was had entered the ship without Kilex's attention, which simply meant that whoever this was, they were on an entirely different level from before. If this had happened before Kilex took over the ship or had happened in a different base, James wouldn't be all that surprised, but due to James' careful behavior and emphasis on caution, Kilex had developed an attitude of being careful too and on top of that with this new ship. Kilex's computing power would have reached a new height, but yet this guy was able to bypass all these things and appear here without detection. Turning around, James found himself looking at a weirdly dressed man who was sitting atop a floating chair. Looking at the man, James relaxed but was still extremely confused. Seeing him, James understood how he had bypassed all the security, but he still couldn't understand why the man was here. Metron? James asked in confusion just like it said Metron said in a language, James didn't know, but somehow he understood it, but he didn't think much of it, since this may be DCS version of the Allspeak, what are you doing here, James asked. He wasn't all that worried that Metron was able to find his way here after all the guy was omniscient or at least he was as long as he was sitting on the Mobius chair. The Mobius chair is a powerful item that has multiple origins, but all of them have one thing in common, as long as Metron was on the Mobius chair, you couldn't touch him, and he had limited attacking methods. Not only that he was completely omniscient as long as he was on the chair. The chair basically served to absolutely protect him from anything aiming against him, the only way you could get him off the chair is through trickery. Of course, he would see that coming, but if you are fast enough then you may manage to touch him. From what James could find about Metron and the Mobius chair, the only means of removing him from the chair was when the writer manufactures some sort of stupid event that would result in him leaving it by himself. For a proposal that I am sure you would accept Metron said as the chair hovered closer to James. I'm listening but before you start, I hope you really thought this through cause I don't want a stupid deal like what you gave Darkseed James said to stop him, with Metron here, he didn't care that he revealed more than he should know, since Metron should and would probably know that he knew more as he was omniscient. Do not worry, I am just a messenger in this situation, if you will allow me, someone wants to see you Metron said, who? You will know soon enough Metron said as his chair suddenly glowed a bit, and they both disappeared from the area. James wasn't too worried that Metron had evil plans against him or anything because well, he believed that as long as the opponent wasn't a reality warper or someone of that level, then he could fight back and was confident in winning, and also because Metron's alignment was neutral, so whatever he was planning wasn't against him, as he was under oath not to interfere. When James opened his eyes again, he found himself inside a large hall that seemed to be a mixture of ancient architecture and extremely advanced technology, thus giving the hall a much different feel than what should be expected. Looking around the hall, James noticed a weird arrangement of the place that made it look like a throne room. It was a throne room, it had a throne that somewhat resembled the Mobius chair, but bigger and much more grand. On the throne was a giant, the man at the very least was 20 meters tall. James expected everything when Metron teleported him here, but this height was just ridiculous, the giant man wore some sort of battle armor, but looking at it, it was obvious that it was more of a ceremonial wear as it was made to dazzle. It was golden in color or probably made out of gold or a similar material, and was highly decorated. James meet the High Father, Izaya Metron said as he hovered in front of James and towards the giant on the throne, as he too along with the chair started growing in size, until he matched the giant on the throne. James didn't find it too surprising that they were this big though it had caught him off guard, but it was known or at least for those that used wiki a lot, that the new gods were giants, but the boom tubes help resize them to fit the places they were going, I could guess that easily, now what am I here for? James asked, not in the least bit afraid. Izaya was powerful, but he was nowhere near Darkseid, and Superman could beat Darkseid, and at the moment, James believed he was even more powerful than Superman. Well he was confident in surviving not winning after all Izaya could manipulate matter at will and more if pushed to the limits just as expected, welcome to New Genesis. 
I believe Metron has told you what you are here for the giant, Izaya asked nope, he just told me someone wanted to see me then brought me here, James hovered up into the air a little to check if his powers worked well here too. Ever since arriving here, James felt extremely refreshed for some reason. He didn't know if this was brought about by the fact that he was currently in a higher dimension or something else after all new genesis existed in the fourth world, Akka the fourth dimension. He was absorbing an unknown type of energy that just felt about 100x more refreshing than solar radiation. James didn't know what it was after all he didn't exactly have much knowledge about the environment here, so it might just be that he was absorbing the radiation from New Genesis's sun. That is if it had one. He felt his strength growing at more than just 2x what it used it. Higher dimension suns were really something else in James' opinion, he didn't know exactly what energy he was absorbing, but he wanted more of it. Just a few seconds, he was here. It felt as though he was in the sun for three days or something like that. Then I apologize for that, we called you here to ask for your help in the current war, or at least the one that is about to take place. Apocalypse may seem to be quiet, but we need not delude ourselves thinking that they won't attack someday Zaya said, so basically you want me to join a battle that currently has nothing to do with me, James asked we both know that in the nearest future, Darkseed would attack Earth, leading to the loss of thousands of lives. True, we can't exactly kill Darkseed, but we can stop him before he causes damage. Initially we could do nothing, but somehow since your birth, the future became uncertain as Arya stated as he looked at James with a look of intrigue on his face, I know that but in that nearest future too, we also have two Kryptonians protecting the earth. One gave Darkseed enough problems that he had retreat, what makes you think that two wouldn't be able to stop him within minutes of his appearance, James asked, he wasn't too surprised that Azaya knew what would happen in the future after all, they had several new gods on New Genesis, who had some sort of divinity related to knowledge or something like that. These gods could easily see the future if they wanted, but actually doing something about it was a whole different matter. Yes, they could change little things, but trying to change major events like Darkseed's attack on Earth may have very serious consequences, so even if they knew about the attack and the breaking of the truce, they could do nothing but watch it happen since changing it or even tampering with it a little may bring about severe consequences, but with his birth, things were different. James was an anomaly in the entire DC multiverse. There was never a timeline where Superman had a brother in existence, so his presence raised a lot of uncertainties, meaning that for once, the future was actually uncertain for these gods, so they would inform Azaya about it who would then in turn ask Metron for confirmation and boom. He was here. Sure, two powered Kryptonians working together can stop Darkseed, but it seems you are underestimating Darkseed's power as a new god and a tyrant. If Darkseed was that weak, New Genesis would have destroyed Apocalypse long ago, so what exactly are you offering me for my help, nothing is free even in free town, James replied, what do you want Azaya asked, I would have asked for a piece of 10th metal, but you would never agree to that would you? You know the answer to that expected, you can just give me a Motherbox instead, I do not have the power to do that, but I can lend you one Azaya said, offering another way out, you and I both know only an idiot would accept that James replied, being lent one basically means that you are using someone else's Motherbox, thus that person would be able to monitor your every action. I think I can help here Metron suddenly said, breaking the tension which was already rising in the room great that means I can get my very own Motherbox right, James asked yes, but we have no power in this, the Motherboxes have minds of their own, and can select who they want to bond with. If you don't get one then forget about a Motherbox Metron said, sure, if none bonds with me, then I help without any payback, James replied with a smile good Metron said, and they both disappeared from the throne room, leaving Isaiah alone. When they reappeared again, James found himself in a large room with thousands if not millions of brick-like devices. All of them looked as high-tech as they could be with some of them being perfect cubes, while others looked exactly like bricks. These bricks were the Motherboxes, the most powerful computers in existence. Looking at the way they were stored here, James suddenly felt like beating up some new gods. Motherboxes were basically omnipotent computers, James had yet to see a task a Motherbox wasn't able to accomplish. Resurrecting the dead, sure, a mother box can do it or at least know how to do it, creating new life, oh please, it can make your toaster into a sentient machine. Give you superpowers, bitch please, wearing it as an armor gives you superman level physical prowess. The mother box could do it all, but due to the new gods who were well gods, they didn't exactly realize the true power of the paw system they had, but packing them like this was just insulting to the awesome computers. So what now James asked just wait, if you are chosen, one of. Oh you are chosen Metron said as he noticed one of the Motherboxes float up and flight towards James. Would you look at that, looks like I'm a chosen one, James said with a sarcastic smile on his face no need for the sass boy, just take the Motherbox Metron said, and teleported them out of there and back into the throne room. 
I never thought a Mothbox would ever bond to a mortal Azaya said surprised well I'm just built different, so call me when you need me, Heyman or Metron should have my number we will contact you when needed Azaya said while James got a little more familiar to his Mothbox Mothboxes can only communicate with their users through a series of pings that can only be understood by their users. Basically it could only communicate using a form of telepathy, so when looking at James who was communicating with his Mothbox, you wouldn't hear even as much as a sound from him. Mother boxes can communicate with you in two forms, with the pings or just straight out telepathy, and James had chosen telepathy as it allowed him to better enforce his will on the computer. Open. James commanded in an exaggerated pose, and immediately after a tiny explosion of light was seen as a portal that seemed to look like a road that led to eternity appeared in the room. Ha 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 ha, hush tubes are the best James screamed in joy, then hovered into the portal, leaving behind a flabbergasted Isaiah. Metron expected it, but Isaiah had never seen something like this. Mother boxes are able to open extra-dimensional portals that can take someone or even an entire country from one point in space and time to another. These portals were called boom tubes after the loud boom. Sound it makes whenever it's about to open, the new gods were used to this sound whenever someone opens a boom tube, but James had just opened one with little noise. Isaiah had never heard or even seen a boom tube that doesn't make the booming noise. As for hush tubes, they were a version of the boom tubes that were silent and was something that would be invented later in the future. They worked exactly like boom tubes just with lesser or no noise at all, the Justice League used them mostly for stealth missions and such, but James was someone who didn't like his entrance to cause much noise thus, rather than just accept the boom tubes the way they were like the new gods did. James conveyed his thoughts to the Motherbox, and it opened one. Motherboxes were omniscient too, so it surely knew what a hush tube was. James earnestly didn't know why the new gods didn't utilize the mother boxes as well as they should, but it wasn't much of a concern for him, since he planned to show them just how powerful a mother box can be in the right hands. West Texas thousands of meters underground, doomsday ship. Inside the ship which had now rearranged itself to occupy the large space outside it, a tiny explosion of light was seen as a portal appeared, and a young man floated out of it with a massive smile on his face. James looked like a kid who had found a new toy. Well he was a kid who had found a new toy, but unlike a regular kid, he knew the type of power his new toy held. Just a few seconds with the Motherbox and he already had ideas. Initially he was limited by the fact that he couldn't reach other dimensions, and if he wanted to do so, then he would need to learn magic, really powerful magic, but now he could even travel to alternate universes if he wanted. Boom tubes allow for instant travel between any two places, it doesn't matter if it's an alternate universe or just your bedroom to the toilet. The mother box could do it all, but that wasn't all, using the boom tubes he could travel to any dimension he wanted in the DC multiverse. Was it the monitor world then no problems, mother boxes draw power from the source, it can make it happen. The fifth dimension, sure, go have lunch with Mr. Mxivilk if you want. The new gods had the greatest invention ever made, but they didn't know how to use it. With the mother box's ability to draw power from the source itself, it is capable of basically anything as the source was omnipotent, and even a drop of energy from it can allow you do the impossible. The mother boxes receive a constant supply of this omnipotent energy, and don't use them because most don't think about it. Kelex, I deposit a copy of your core coding here and leave James said as he sat on the throne that came with the ship May, I ask why Sir Kelex asked, you would die if you remain here when I start what I plan to do, James replied affirmative Sir Kelex replied. It was at moments like this that James liked the fact that Kelex couldn't comprehend emotions, yes, its computing power had increased to a massive degree, but its programming didn't allow it process or understand emotions, it was made just to take care of the family and obey our commands. Copy created Kelex said as a holographic screen appeared before James, this was to allow him a better control over the ship, since without Kelex, controlling the ship just became much more complicated than required. Making sure that Kelex had left the ship systems completely, James placed a floating Motherbox at the top of the throne. He planned to connect the Motherbox to the base, and if possible, upgrade it but to do so, he would have to connect the Motherbox's sentience or mind to the ship, meaning if Kelex had stayed, only death awaited him after all, nothing could beat the Motherboxes in terms of technology. Ping the mother box made a sound to indicate its connection, and James smiled at this, as he willed the mother box to take over and upgrade the ship's features, from stealth systems to weaponry, cleaner bots to lab equipment. James wanted nothing but the best, as the Motherbox's mind connected to the AI core that Kelex had left behind, it immediately mutated it, thus making it far much better than it should normally be as well as enforcing its purpose. James couldn't tell how, but he could feel or tell as these things were happening despite not actually being in control. After connecting itself to the core, several markings appeared on the throne as there and downwards and covered the entire ship in just a few seconds. 
James didn't know exactly what was going on, but he could at least tell the end result. The Motherbox wanted to redesign the Sunstone crystals in use. Sunstone was already awesome on its own, so James was eager to find out what it would turn to after the upgrade. James hovered into the air obeying the instructions of the Motherbox, and minutes later, the originally dark ship changed entirely. Sunstone, no matter how you configure it would always have its smooth texture to indicate that it was a crystal and not a metal, but at the moment, it had lost that as the entire base's design was changed, according to the many designs that popped into his head. The Motherbox had turned a Sunstone crystal into real programmable matter. The Motherbox was omniscient, and with a little help of omnipotent energy, anything can be achieved. The new base looked nothing like James expected, it seemed as though the Motherbox just let loose and designed what it thought was best, unlike the new gods who basically restricted their mother boxes because they wanted absolute control. James let his do whatever she wanted as long as it aligned with his goal, he didn't have to worry that she betrays him after all Motherboxes can only attend to one host throughout its lifetime, and if the host dies, they die. Well not actually since they can just bring their host back to life. They were just that loyal. Looking at the new design that looked way better than the original, James smiled, then looked back at the main command center of the entire base which was the throne. The throne now looked somewhat like the Mobius chair, but James knew that it has none of the Mobius chair's abilities, but it still looked undeniably cool. Confirming that the process was already done, James returned back to his original position which was the throne. As soon as he sat down, James felt an instant connection to the entire ship, as though he was the ship itself. It was amazing, he didn't need an AI to control the ship when he could control the entire thing with his mind alone, as for the AI core that Keelex had left behind. The Motherbox had turned it into some sort of relay port for the mind, it housed the mind that was connected to the ship, and allowed it to interface with the ship, as though it was the ship itself. Basically the AI core grants your mind the abilities of an AI, as soon as you are bonded to the ship. Damn, this is awesome, James said as he experimented with the features of the ship, he has some sort of omniscient view of the ship base, thus allowing him to control multiple parts of base at the same time. You, my dear are the best thing to happen to me now, James said as he grabbed the Motherbox from the top of the throne. Even when he wasn't on the throne, he could still feel his connection to the base. Now do I make all my things Keelex free or what James thought, since using his mind to control these things was massively convenient, but he wasn't going to delude himself with that, Keelex was extremely e-scient, and was as useful as he could be Keelex. You can reconnect to the base now, James said as he opened a port on throne, and inserted a USB drive formed using the nanite suit he was wearing upload completed new update detected. Undergoing upgrade 100% rebooting. Kelex Online Sir I think the upgrade changed my entire being, Kelex said in a more humane manner, James didn't need to guess exactly what caused this upgrade in Kelex, since he knew that it had something to do with the AI core, that the Motherbox had mutated. What do you think changed my processing power is infinitely better than before, my personality matrix is now well defined, and I think I can run the company far better than I ever did previously Kelex replied, and James smiled for an AI like Kelex to even say something as abstract as infinitely better. It means that his processing power must have improved by so much that it could really quantify it anymore. James didn't think that Keelex's words were an exaggeration, since he knew that Motherboxes had access to the entire knowledge reservoir of the new gods, and by letting the Motherbox lose in its upgrades, basically meant that the Motherbox had upgraded the base or at least all the equipment in it. Ma, can you assist Keelex? James asked, effectively naming the Motherbox, Ma. Ping the Motherbox made a sound to indicate its acceptance. Hearing this, James placed the Motherbox back on the throne to connect it back to the base. Connection established, sir I now have access to her database Keelex replied good, Ma would allow you access to its new god database, I want you to learn as much as you can, and maybe you can redesign some of the weapons or vehicles we have here, James said after all this was a battleship. It is supposed to have an array of weapon that are meant for the soldiers and some vehicles meant for fast deployment of soldiers. Affirmative sir, please do I have your permission to redesign my servers Keelex suddenly asked huh? Ma just upgraded the base's systems right yes, she did, but apparently this is just superficial upgrades, as you didn't specify on exactly what she should upgrade, thus she upgraded everything though not to its very limits oh. Well you're free to do so, James replied trying to hide his embarrassment. Turns out while Motherboxes were sentient computers that can do basically anything, you still have to be specific. Leaving the Motherbox to do as it likes allowed it to actively upgrade everything about the ship, including certain things that James or Keelex may not deem important enough to upgrade, but didn't take things too far since James hadn't specified on what he wanted. Thank you Sir Keelex replied as it immediately got to work, and the base shook a little as Keelex did its thing. Keelex already had absurd levels of computing power after it merged back with the core he had left behind, but then upgrading his servers personally. 
He was taking things to an entirely dire end level. Kilex had used the adjective infinitely better to describe his upgrade, despite it not being so, but at the moment, that phrase may not be so much of an exaggeration. The new gods may not rely too much on other computers because they mostly used the Motherboxes, but they still had vastly powerful computers that were close to the Motherbox in terms of computing power, but since the Motherbox was well. A Motherbox, even that little die errands could be impossible to breach. Upgrade complete, sir I am ready to begin learning now Kilex replied sure go on. Oh and don't share that knowledge with any other person in future do you understand, James warned air made of good James said, then returned to the throne. He had to warn Kilex for one reason only. Kilex would eventually work for Clark, and if Kilex carelessly shared information Clark isn't supposed to know, then it may affect his future battles. For example, Clark could use the information Kilex gives him to easily render himself immune to kryptonite, and then all hell would break loose, though it doesn't mean that Kilex wouldn't use the knowledge it holds to help him achieve his goals. At the moment, James was completely bored because the entire base was mostly quiet, as the learning process between Ma and Kilex was extremely silent. I now have a base, but I still don't have the mind-bending power I want, James thought as he sat on the throne bored out of his mind. Out of boredom, James' mind started roaming around. With the Motherbox, a lot more doors opened up for him to become powerful. Initially he was only limited to what he had access to in this universe, and the highest source of power James saw was magic, but he had zero access to any magical zone or place in the universe, so even that too was locked away from him, but with the entry of the Motherbox. He could master magic in just a few weeks, because the Motherbox was omniscient, and could easily figure out the easiest way to teach him, and would correct every mistake. Not only that, the Motherbox also opened the doors to the multiverse, meaning that James could now travel from one universe to another or one dimension to another. I could recreate the same experiment as Dr. Manhattan James thought, but immediately killed the idea, there was no guarantee that he would be able to maintain his mind after the process. He could theoretically use the Motherbox to maintain his consciousness during the process that will ensure his survival, but even then, James rejected the idea to James, that experiment could only turn out in two ways. He either becomes like Dr. Manhattan or he becomes like Alan Adamaka the Quantum Superman, both of whom are extremely powerful in their own way. Dr. Manhattan is more on the action side of things, while Quantum Superman is more on the knowledge side of things. Both are powerful, but the Quantum Superman senses are way beyond Dr. Manhattan, and in turn, Dr. Manhattan possesses more raw power than him. With the Motherbox's existence, James could replicate the procedure, and he was at least 95% sure that it would work, since the Motherbox can ensure that his consciousness is stable and preserved, as well as help to reconstruct his body, meaning that he may even reform his body faster than both Manhattan and Alan, but there was one small problem. James didn't want their near omniscient abilities, he just wanted the power. Viewing all points in time was nice, and all but seriously how do you live through life, if you know what would happen and worse of all, the two can't or know this ability at all. Oh I can just trap and take control of a fifth dimensional imp's body James thought, but immediately laughed oh the idea, he couldn't even do that if he tried, the imp would just imagine him out of existence. I really have fewer options though I can just do it like the Batman who laughs James thought, but still killed said thought after all he didn't want Manhattan's overpowering senses that had reached the level of calling it omniscience. Learning procedure completed Kilex suddenly said great, you can start your work, I'm going home, James said as he yawned out of boredom, then picked up the Motherbox yes sir Kilex answered, so James nodded, then made the Motherbox create a hush tube to the barn. As the portal appeared, James immediately sped into it. Arriving inside the cramped space, in order not to waste too much time, James just created a portal back to the base, and threw all the equipment into it. After doing this, James retired to the main building and went to bed. He wasn't physically exhausted, but his mind was a whole different case. A year later, middle of nowhere, the ocean, home to a vast number of aquatic creatures that are lived in it. One of the greatest mysteries to the modern people is no one has been able to truly explore all parts of the ocean. Today, something could be seen causing massive waves of water to splash out, as it passed almost as though it wanted to split the chaotically calm ocean. Looking closer, you would be able to see the cause of all this, it was a young man who had a small box floating beside him, who looked to be in his twenties. Who was running? The young man could be seen running across the ocean at near impossible speeds, thus allowing him to float on water. It had been an entire year since his meeting with the new gods, and James could say that things were really going extremely well for him. Due to a recent merger between Kilex and the Mother Box, Kilex was adopted as the consciousness of the Mother Box, meaning that James now had true access to the Mother Box's true database, not just its new god database, though Kilex still refuses to tell him anything about the future, anything happening in the present or had happened was absolute fair game. With access to technology like that, James was placed on a whole different level.
Genetic editing could now be done on a fly, and the best example of this was the Kents. James earnestly didn't know why Clark didn't genetically grant his parents immunity, using the type of technology he had access to. Yes, it will require them to maybe spend a month in a lab, but it would allow him to have peace of mind as he goes around inspiring hope in people. The Kents didn't agree at first, but after months of convincing, they finally agreed and now. The Kent couple were not only immune to physical damage, they were also immune, psionically and spiritually, basically James decided to just go all the way and make it impossible to kill them through any means. Toxins were of no use because their bodies are covered by transparent force fields that automatically filter out toxins that are harmful to their bodies. Then just for the sake of it, James rendered Clark immune to kryptonite, all forms of it. Initially James would never do this, but after truly thinking about it, James decided otherwise. Clark was an absolute symbol of hope, and a true representation of the L family symbol, yes, green kryptonite, could be used to stop him when necessary, but it was also something utilized by a lot of his villains against him, and apart from that, there was also other forms of kryptonite which most of them had unknown EX, and some were simply used to turn him, evil. With that in place, James was free as he focused more on his company rather than anything else, his plan for near absolute power was put on hold, though now he had other ways to achieve power, unlike before where his imagination was limited. He could create a device that could alter reality by tapping into the quantum realm, or he could genetically alter his physique to draw power from the quantum realm, thus allowing him to do just that, he could even just grant himself matter manipulation powers and train himself till he is near omnipotent. He could even replicate Dr. Manhattan's accident with mental inhibitors in place that would allow him retain his emotions or humanity, however you call it. All this was now easy for James, he could genetically alter someone's DNA with absolute precision on the fly. He could give someone absolute power but at the same time place. A very precise weakness in the same power he gives someone. Such scary precision shouldn't be something someone can achieve at any moment, but with access to technology that can only be explained as godly, James could do it all. Make an alloy of any metal impossibly hard, turn said impossible metal transparent, turn an entire portion of the sea into fresh water if he wanted or even rejuvenate the Sahara if he wanted. Sir, you are at a suitable position Kelex suddenly said, this message came directly to his mind due to the psionic link between James and the Mother Box. Thank you James said, then immediately hovered up into that air a little and shot into the skies as he got out of the Earth's gravitational field in just a few secs. As soon as James left the planet entirely, a visible but slightly transparent shield appeared around his body as he shot towards the red planet in the distance. Mars, for some reason, James still hadn't figured out there was a Martian still alive or a group of Martians still alive. He had long since confirmed that the Martian John Johns was on Earth, and according to several media, the man was the last of his kind, with the exception of Miss Martian, who was sent out of the planet before the plague wiped out the rest of the population, but then of course, there was also some cases where they didn't die off, but to James, it doesn't make sense after all, if John Johns could fly, then why didn't he just fly himself back to his planet, but a day ago, he had received a psionic distress signal from the planet. Kelex as soon as we arrive, form suit James sent his thought to the Motherbox affirmative sir within seconds, James was floating on Mars surface. The entire place was just a massive red desert, if James didn't know that the Martians lived underground. He would have thought that the planet was lifeless in fact, if it wasn't for the distress signal he received from the planet, James already had plans for Rao Industries to create the first Mars habitats, basically he would beat the rest of the world just by doing that, and if he manages to terraform the entire planet, then the people would recognize Rao Industries as its own government, but since the Martians were still alive, the plans were now directed to Venus a planet which was actually easier to terraform. As soon as James landed on the planet's surface, a suit of armor appeared on his body seemingly forming from thin air. The armor looked extremely similar to that of the new gods, which was basically a near-skin tight cloth that seems to be made of some sort of metallic material and looked like it was made to make the wearer look more godlike. The armor came with a helmet that covered the entirety of his head, except his face making him look like some futuristic warrior, but the aesthetics of the suit was in James' aim. The suit was made to protect his mind from the Martians after all he didn't need any other protection, since he was already as invulnerable as someone can be. Sir the call is coming from under the planet's surface, searching for location now Kelex said, MMM James nodded, then suddenly his entire body started shaking and continued doing so, as the speed increased until James was nothing more than a blur to most people. James vibing got so intense that it looked as though James was being possessed by some being, but that wasn't all, as James slowly started sinking into the ground, as though he had suddenly gained intangibility. James continued passing through seemingly endless layers of earth until he finally arrived inside a massive underground space. The entire space was somehow extremely lit despite it being thousands of meters below the planet's surface. 
Looking around James easily spotted the massive pillars that supported the entire structure from caving in, the pillars seemed to merge with the surfaces it touched. Apart from the weird pillars, there was also the weird building and design of the massive city below him. The building style looked more like caves to James than actual buildings, but his X-ray vision was saying otherwise. At the moment, the entire city was in complete shambles, with several buildings caved in, and several vehicles crashed into some buildings, it was pure chaos. Kelex language James suddenly called out as he examined the space-transferring Martian language pack Kelex said, and in the next second, James felt a large amount of information flow into his mind. James processed all of it in just mere seconds as he became proficient in the new language he was just taught. To James, this was the most e-scient means of learning as it was extremely fast, especially when one had a mind like his. The Martian language wasn't exactly hard to learn for him, but the problem now was that he couldn't exactly find any Martians around. Did you find the source of the call, James asked as he took off flying in a random direction, but kept his eyes open for any green Martians, since he believed that if there was any race that would call for his help from Mars, then it was the green Martians, after all the white ones were all mad. To the east Kelex said specific directions please James asked as he turned east and started flying towards the location, though at more limited speeds. With Kelex giving the exact directions to the place, James arrived within just a few seconds. He could have definitely gotten there faster, but he was within a habitable zone, any more speed than this would result in mass destruction, and if there were any survivors in this rubble, then they would die as it collapsed. Arriving at the location, James saw a large cave with its entrance covered by a massive rock. James didn't believe that the Martians had called his help for the massive rock after all they could become intangible with ease, and he also didn't believe they would call for help because of a war, after all the white Martians and the green Martians are evenly matched in both strength. Speed and psionic power in fact James believed that they should have people that were even on par with him or even stronger, so the only real scenario where the Martians would ask for help, would be if they suddenly and dramatically reduced in numbers. Good day Martian, my name is Rao L, I have come to answer your call, James said in perfect Martian as he landed before the massive rock. Kelex was already detecting several life forces behind the rock, so there was definitely someone or some people behind it, and they could hear him after all, John the Manhunter has super senses too, that are just as sensitive as a Kryptonian's. Welcome Rao L of Earth, an aged voice suddenly replied as the rock rolled out of the way to reveal three Martians of different colors, green, red and blue. Behind them were also several other Martians who were all hiding behind a roll of green Martians, holding some type of gun-like weapon of course, there are other colors James thought and rolled his eyes. He knew about the white and green Martians, but he had absolutely no idea that there were red and even blue ones. At this point, if he suddenly saw a black Martian. He wouldn't be surprised after all the Martians were now playing lanterns. Honestly it was a surprise to him how the Guardians haven't recruited all the Martians as lanterns, considering that there is a lantern for each color of the rainbow, we thank you for answering our call. My people and I have waited for someone who can help us survive this war, the elderly man said as he and his bodyguards got closer, I can see that, but first exactly why did you call me, you guys all have strength equal to mine, you don't really need my help, James said true, but we don't need your help to fight in the war, we need your help as our enemy has spread a plaque amongst my people. Our technology has been rendered useless before this plaque, the elderly Martian said oh. I can do that with ease, James said with pride. He didn't need to know the exact plaque this was to know that he could easily defeat it, after all the level of his technology was approaching a ridiculous level, but what James was concerned about was the fact that Martian technology was useless before this plaque. James didn't need any sort of fortune teller or precognition or even omniscience to know that Martians were one of the best biotechnology users in the universe. These were a group of people that matched Kryptonians completely with just biotechnology alone, Kryptonians had incredible technology, but that was achieved by mastering multiple fields, but the Martians be like well fuck it, we will fuck them all up with biotechnology, and that's all, but despite that the Martians were stomped by this plaque which raises the question. How did the white Martians get their hands on such a powerful toxin? Great. Excellent, my people and I are eternally grateful for your kindness, the man said as he excitedly turned around and started walking towards the cave where the others were located. Don't sweat it James said then followed him. Following the group into the cave, James finally saw why the Martians were on par with the Kryptonians. The inside of the cave, while it didn't have the flashy sci-fi looks that James had expected after all this was an alien civilization. The space was built more like a fortress with spaces for the people to sleep, canteens, medical bays which were all filled with multiple Martians, who were all groaning and shifting around in pain on their beds. Why isn't there anyone taking care of them, James asked when he noticed the lack of caregivers in the medical bays, there were people taking care of them, but they have all joined them, the man replied in a much more saddened tone, this is as far as we can go. 
We are not to go beyond this door, neither are we to communicate with them least we risk the rest of our people. The man said he and his entourage stopped before the door, no problems, James said without much thought as he entered the large room. As soon as he entered the room, James was immediately assaulted with a strange smell and a heavy aura of despair. It was clear that some of the Martians here had long since given up on life, but looking at them with both his X-ray vision and all, James couldn't really see anything wrong with them, they were all just as healthy as those outside Kelex scanned them. I don't think this the so-called plague is physical, James said as he looked around commencing scan Kelex said, as several small drones emerged from James' body specifically, his suit, they formed from his suit and flew around scanning each patient. James was free as he walked around the large room, normally he should be afraid of any sort of toxin that could affect the Martians after all, who is to say that it wouldn't affect Kryptonians too, but at the moment, James wasn't really worried since he knew that his suit made that impossible to achieve, and even if it is achieved. He knew that his body would immediately burn through the toxin, as though it was nothing. Even without too much scrutiny James already had a hunch of what was going on, and if he was right, then the white Martians are extremely smart. Sir they are physically healthy, but their minds on the other hand Kelex said, then trailed off, just as I expected James said, then chuckled as he shook his head. No wonder Martian technology was rendered useless, Martian tech was mighty and on par with Kryptonians, but the Martians may have not considered that something would ever beat them mentally or even thought they could ever get sick mentally. From his earlier scans, he had suspected that the white Martians may have figured out some way to pollute their world mind. He didn't have the exact details, but James knew one thing, and it was that all Martians are beings that can be said to be the embodiment of the statement, mind over matter. Whatever they think actually happens to them. They have near absolute control over their physiology, so whatever they fear becomes a weakness, and if their minds are being attacked, their bodies too get attacked. Somehow the white Martians had created a toxin that could affect the Martians psionically, which is smart in James' book, because the last place a Martian would expect a fellow Martian to attack is their minds when they know that they are almost evenly matched. The perfect blind spot. Kelex you know any suitable solutions, the best solution is that they all disconnect from their world mind, since most of them are already infected, and only need to be touched by an infected to get ill Kelex suggested true, but exactly how do we convince these people to disconnect from their hive mind, James replied, knowing that most of the Martians here, had probably never experienced a day. Without the world mind. You may not need to do so, with enough power, you can split the mental space in two, one for them, and the other for the white Martians, I don't understand, what do you mean? James asked in confusion, he knew that as a mother box, Kelex would never suggest something he couldn't do, but he knew that there was no way he had the power to break a space supported by the mind of millions of extremely powerful telepaths. He wasn't even a telepath to begin with. It may have been theorized that a Kryptonian's main ability is actually psionic in nature, but it didn't mean that he could break the world mind in two. It was a space sustained by a race of the universe's most powerful minds, he doubted he would be able to do anything to it, I never suggested that you could do it, but I can do it with the help of an actual telepath, a Martian O. Oh that makes more sense, James said as he turned towards the door, the door of the room was some transparent membrane that allowed the people outside see into the room. Behind the door now was the elderly Martian and his bodyguards. Knowing that they wouldn't come in, no matter what, James decided to meet them outside. Is it something your people's technology can resolve? The Martian asked yes, but there are two ways we can do this, though both would end up in the same way, will it save my people? Yes, but to do so, I need your help. Who is the most powerful telepath amongst you? That would be me the elderly Martian answered Kelex. James asked to confirm it doesn't matter who it is Kelex replied, okay then, sir if you will please follow me, James said, pointing to the outside of the safe house. What do you plan to do? The Martian asked and James just smiled James didn't know how their world mind worked so for the safety of the other Martians, he planned to move as far away from the safe house as possible. This was simply because he didn't know if the white Martian had some means of tracking them through the world mind. We are leaving the planet, the white Martians were fully capable of releasing a toxin into the world mind. I don't know if they have any means of tracking your locations James explained, none of us have such an ability the elderly man assured, but James didn't want to take his words for it. It's just a safety measure, you can't be too sure, okay, follow me James replied, then hovered into the air, if the chief is leaving, then I must follow a younger Martian shouted sure, as long as someone stays behind to watch the other, now let's go, James replied without even thinking about it. With that James immediately blasted off into the distance, leaving behind an extremely loud sonic boom. He didn't have to worry that the white Martians would use it to find the hiding Martians, since due to the enclosed space, the sound itself sounded as though it came from the planet itself. It echoed that much. A few seconds later, the three arrived on the surface of the planet, and James could be seen holding a helmet of some sort, as he placed it on the head of the elderly Martian. 
The helmet was made by Keelex using the ever-reproducing nanites on James' body. Wear this, it would amplify your mental prowess to the level of the gods for a few minutes, but there is a small catch. You wouldn't be yourself while wearing it, James explained as plainly as possible for them to understand, what does that mean? Simple, what we need is the mind of a telepath, and yours is more than qualified for it. Once you wear the helmet, my companion would briefly take over your body to get the job done though it does so, you are to point out the consciousness of the sick amongst your people to be healed, I can't allow that? The younger Martian who was acting as his bodyguard said as he stood between James and the elderly Martian seeing this, James simply raised his hand and stepped back after all, not everyone was like Kent Nelson, who had no problems with Nabu taking control of his body. The plan here was to briefly promote the elderly man into a god. A real god and yes, Kelex had such an ability. With such a massive boost in power, it wouldn't be hard for him to destroy the world mind and remake it as many times as he wants. The problem with this plan was that James didn't trust the man. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and this was a man whose family members had been wiped out by an unnecessary war. He will immediately turn against the White Martians and wipe them out with a wave of his hand. James didn't want that, he had other plans for the White Martians, hence why Kelex was ordered to take control of his mind in the duration of the process. Does it guarantee the recovery of my people? The man asked absolutely, then I will do it, he replied with a determined look on his face. The man looked like he was about to die when all he was doing was wearing a helmet. Ignoring the man's expression, James placed the helmet on the man's head, and immediately his entire look and outfit started changing. Well the outfit was technically a part of his body since the Martians he had seen so far had all been naked. It honestly made sense after all it allowed for easy and extremely quick changes when shape shifting. The man slowly started turning younger as his Martian face slowly started to regain some youthfulness to it. The aura surrounding him grew stronger and stronger by the minute until the Martian who was standing guard beside him fell to his knees. Multiple hostile detected Kelex announced into his mind. Hearing her, James immediately turned around to search for them, but all he saw were multiple white silhouettes that were bowing in the direction of the elderly Martian. Kelex had turned the old man into some psionic omnipotence hence the scene. Well they wouldn't be attacking anytime soon, James concluded after seeing their postures. With the enemy briefly halted, James watched on as Kelex immediately began her work. The power needed to destroy a structure that encompassed several billions of extremely powerful minds was immense, but for the newborn god, it was nothing. The main problem here was identifying the toxin itself and destroying it. Kelex didn't take long before she found it, but since this was something that had been engraved into the minds of many Martians. It required a form of psychosurgery or telepathic surgery, whichever you prefer, to get rid of it completely, so Kelex put every Martian on the planet be them, green, blue, red or white to sleep. Within minutes of waiting, Kelex was done with that, and before her was this grey swirl of energy that represented the virus. Here it didn't matter what form or what color the virus took, hence why it looked like some cartoon semi-sentient virus. With thought, she erased the virus from existence, then turned to her final mission. As a motherbox, Kelex naturally knew everything about the world mind. She knew where every mind was on it, and knew which from which with ease. Naturally, Kelex didn't need any help in creating the new world mind, or even curing the minds of the Isle Martians, the man was only told that he would help to point out the sick, so that he would feel like he was contributing when Kelex just needed him because of his physiology as a Martian. Within seconds, Kelex had constructed a mental space that was extremely similar to the original world mind, but with many improvements that would prevent any such incidents in future. She transferred the minds of all the Martians into the new space, with the exception of the white Martians. As for the original world mind, it was left as it was though on James' instructions. She left a very good gift for the white Martians who were now the only inhabitants of the space. After checking to see if all was well, Kelex began the process of devolving the man. Before you do that, kill the white Martians in our vicinity, James called out when he noticed the intensity of the godly aura reducing as you wish Kelex replied, and the elderly Martian raised his hand as James witnessed the white Martians who were still sleeping fade into nothingness. The scene brought back the long-forgotten sense of fear he should normally have. To such power, one's invulnerability or strength did not matter and worse, there were many people who held such powers, and many of them would be enemies of his brother. From Darkseed to Gog, they could all manipulate matter in any way they want even to the extent of manipulating reality. Kelex was able to erase these Martians from existence with just a thought, and anyone who knows their stuff would know that Martians are more powerful than Kryptonians if they truly wish to let loose. This meant that she could probably do the same to him. It was moments like this that made James remember just the type of universe he was in. The best counter he had found to those almighty powers was the mystical Kryptonian martial arts, Torquasm Rao and whatever the other one was called, but Kelex had confirmed that no such thing exists. 
This meant that he would need to find another way to gain abilities that would help him counter matter or reality manipulation. While James was going through an existential crisis, Kelex had completed her devolution process on the Martian Elder. The man was now back to normal, but he was sleeping just like the other Martians. It was better this way, it would allow him forget the power he just experienced or at least dismiss it as a dream, and it would also help him adjust to the new world mind just like the other Martians. Sir? Yes? James answered waking from his trance, what is it? I am done, the Martians are now freed from their torment, you don't need to make it sound like some biblical thing. Just help me get these two back to their hideout, James said with a sigh as he grabbed the younger Martian and started phasing, while Kelex lifted the elderly one and followed James through whatever godly means she thought of this wasn't because James found the Martians too heavy for him to carry, instead it was because he felt his phasing wouldn't be so gentle on the old Martian. The innocent man has already experienced being forcefully elevated to godly status, which probably strained his mind a bit, it would be cruel of him to phase, while holding him after all, while phasing may look cool and all, it was a very violent act. Passing through hundreds of kilometers of nothing but dirt and stone, James and Kelex finally arrived in the Martian habitable zone, so they quickly flew the unconscious men back to their hideout. Thankfully, the hideout itself recognized the Martians and allowed them in. Now what do we do? James asked himself as he watched the sleeping Martians, he couldn't just leave them as they were. It wasn't about protection, rather he felt that if he left, they will probably forget that he was the one who helped them, and they will attribute his and Kelex's work to some random god. He didn't need them to worship him or anything, but he wanted them to at least be grateful to him. He was in a universe where everything makes a difference. A simple relationship you had with someone could mean you will survive an event, or simply sleeping in when you're supposed to be somewhere else could mean you don't survive some other event. Now him, making the Martians grateful to him could mean that he will probably become able to survive an event he shouldn't be able to, and besides who didn't want an army they can summon with just a call. With that thought in mind, James sat down waiting for the Martians to wake up. According to Kelex, it shouldn't take much time, so James sat tight and spent his time just figuring out Martian technology. True, he had god-level technology and even a nigh-omnipotent device known as a mother box, but it was still fun and interesting to decode Martian-level biotechnology. While James spent his time doing nothing, in the new white Martian mental space or world mind. The gift Kelex had left under James' orders began to spread amongst the sleeping Martians. It jumped from one white Martian to another without care if they were close to each other or even related. It moved erratically and quickly. With each infection came a profound change that couldn't be witnessed even by the white Martians themselves, and they will probably never find out until it's too late. Earth unknown location inside a large underground cave, a huge face could be seen held up by the earth itself, the face had cracks and rock formations growing all over it, as though it was formed from the earth itself. Apart from the face, the cave looked as normal as things could get with the exception of the staff that could be seen floating a few meters away from the face. A new god? A somewhat weak thought rang throughout the cave, it seems my journey doesn't end here, my fate is as always favorable as second thought followed the first, but this time, it was much more powerful and almost overbearing. With the second thought, the cave started glowing as a burst of light came from it and onto the stone face in the cave. In the presence of the light, the face started to change, the rocks fell o it revealing an unnatural set of dark silverish blue color underneath it. The entire cave shook, but surprisingly no piece of stone or rock fell despite the cave's topology. With that the face opened its eyes to reveal a bright golden glow which illuminated the entire cave. I shall get you, Kryptonian the face's thought rang out confidently. Meanwhile back on Mars, James could be seen still waiting for the Martians to awaken. At this point, he found it a little bit idiotic to continue waiting. It wasn't like he didn't already have an army, this was just to get them indebted to him, but it seems that wouldn't happen anytime soon well that is, unless one of them had incredibly powerful telepathic potential that may remember him later on if not, none of them will have memories of him existing. Kelex, should I let them be or should I wait longer? James asked there is no point to you waiting, there is no guarantee that they will know who you are, when they wake up Kelex replied, shattering the little hope that had blocked his common sense, that is true, anyway, let's go, they don't have anything to offer me anyway, James thought, then hovered off the ground, as he made his way out of the hideout. His plan was flawed, and he had just wasted nearly two hours of his abundant life doing nothing. James left the hideout but didn't leave the planet immediately, he had other things to take care of, and this was even much more important to him than the Rainbow Martians. An. They are referred to as the Rainbow Martians because there are apparently many colors of Martians. I mean DC thought, why stop at 2 when you can have 12, Mars may not be as big as the Earth, but it was surely a big planet. Unlike the Earth, this entire thing was covered in land, which meant that there was probably even more space on it than on Earth. James flew towards one of the massives that held up the planet. 
Kelex can you retrieve some for analysis? James asked while standing before the pillar sure Kelex replied as the mother box flew towards the pillar. James just stood watching since he had no clue how Kelex would achieve it. The pillar was diurant from the earth that it supported. He could see that its atomic structure was vastly diurant from the earth above ground. It was the metal that the Martians are known to use, psionic biometal. A metal so peculiar when fed enough thoughts becomes semi-sentient. This sentience is proven by the existence of the bioships, James would bet everything he owned on the fact that the first bioship was born by mistake. The Martins had probably created a ship that would allow them explore the vast expanse of space, but because they used psionic biometal in creating the ship. It meant that to get something from the ship, they had to send their thoughts to it, and after years of multiple Martins doing this. The ship became semi-sentient, and after some more years, the bioships became the go-to vehicle for the Martians. I don't think that is how things went Kelex said knowing his train of thought well your tone suggests that I am not too far from the truth, James replied sighs, the mother box released a sigh as it got a small handful of the metal to float out of the pillar. The pillar was made from a metal that responded to telepathy, which was an extremely easy superpower for a mother box to replicate. What do you plan to do with it Kelex asked despite her omniscience experiments, James replied without much thought as he grabbed the sample of the bio metal and immediately blasted O to the surface. His work here was done and waiting for the Martians to wake up wasn't really working out, so he decided to leave after all he had many things to deal with, and besides, he already planted a seed that will grow to become a beautiful tree in the near future. Kelex made him intangible, thus allowing him to phase through the planet's crust with incredible ease and speed. Within seconds, he was already out of its geosynchronous orbit and looking back at the planet. Kelex, what are the chances of the white Martians surviving until I return? 0% if the colored Martians notice before the seed matures and 100% after the seed matures Kelex answered as James frowned, at least that means that there will be something waiting when I return, James said as he turned and headed for Earth. James found Mars to be an interesting planet and had plans for it, though said plans would only be achieved on the long run. Blasting off in the direction of Earth, James went sunbathing for some time before he went back home. Two months later, John, he's live he's live on air, Martha shouted as her voice was heard throughout the house I'm coming, John answered as his footsteps were heard as he ran through the building to meet his wife, who's live, what's happening? James asked as he appeared in the living room James, how many times have I told you not to use super speed inside the house, Martha asked as her cheerful expression was replaced by a serious one, but it's efficient, I don't care, when in this house, you and Clark Walker run at normal speeds, Martha said okay, I'm sorry so who's live? Oh wait, did Clark land a reporting role or something James asked as a smile formed on his face, and he sat down beside her, no Clark is being interviewed for the first time, as the red blue blur? James asked since it was bizarre, the reporter lady gave him an even better name, Superman Martha said as John finally joined the two, he's live? He asked yes. Oh it's coming Martha said excitedly while James sat waiting for Lois to invite the special guest, all the Kents had their eyes trained on the TV as they watched the news channel come back from a commercial and immediately a familiar woman appeared on screen. Lois Lane, the rebel reporter and Clark's future wife Aka his future sister-in-law. Good evening again to you all, and you are still watching the 6 o'clock news with me, Lois Lane is your host. As I said before the break, we had a very special guest for you all, so everyone I would like you all to meet the man who has saved us multiple times in the past, Superman. Lois announced as Clark walked up the stage as soon as Clark appeared, James could hear applause and screams from nearly every household in America. It was clear that despite the fact that Clark over here was still just a newbie hero, his impact could be felt everywhere well at least in America, but as always, there were also the ones who clicked their tongues at him. Ungrateful bastards James muttered under his breath, but took solace in the fact that the cheer far outweighed the hisses. What was that? Martha asked nothing Ma James answered as they all returned to watching the news, after the fake automated applause which was way more exaggerated than the real one, Clark smiled at the camera and sat down looking all Superman why as possible, if that was even a thing. Clark radiated an aura that seemed to tell others that he knew what he was doing, but he could hear Clark's heartbeat, and it was beating like crazy, the boy was nervous, and had no idea what he was going to do online. Thank you all and thank you Miss Lane for having here today, Clark said as he turned to face her and away from the camera no, it is us who have to say thank you for all you have done for us, and also for taking a time out of your busy schedule to be here, Lois said as she offered her hand for a handshake which Clark took gladly as soon as the hands met. James heard Clark's heartbeat increase even more, and immediately began to smile as he shook his head. Clearly at this point, he could just say that Clark had begun to like Lois, but he wouldn't say it had developed into a love situation. Wow, your hands are really soft, I thought it would be rough considering your strength, Lois joked well, my strength doesn't come from physical training, 
It's just how I was born, Clark answered to which James shook his head, agreeing but not so much. True, Kryptonians even if under a red sun were placed under Earth's gravity, they will possess incredible strength and speed, but the difference between normal Kryptonians and them were that they had the younger star which boosted their natural abilities to high heaven. So, he was correct but no so much. Is that so then Superman, what can you tell us about yourself? We don't even know your real name, where you're from or anything, what can you tell us? Oh well considering that this is a formal introduction to the world, my name is Kal-El, and that's spelled K-A-L hyphen E-L, and as many of you had theorized. I am an alien Clark said, and immediately gasps were headed all over America a few people amongst them though immediately began screaming in joy, as the sounds of them collecting money was heard. Honestly James couldn't blame them, if he was a normal person on this planet, he too would have placed a bet that Superman was an alien or a metahuman at the very least. That was unexpected, majority of America had theorized that you were a metahuman, you know my be. Father actually had a theory that I could be from an offshoot race of humans that somehow found themselves on another planet. My anatomy is incredibly similar to yours except a few other organs, Clark said as a joke, but clearly Lois didn't understand James and the other was just happy that Clark hadn't mentioned about him, since that will create a lot of alarms, and also Clark was misquoting him. He had said that there was a possibility that humans in this universe weren't allowed to fully mature or evolve. Humanity in the general scheme of things didn't make much sense. Every race that resembled humanity even a little bit had natural racial ability. The Kryptonians had their solar energy absorption, the Carabum though extinct, had their unimaginable energy manipulating powers and physical prowess. Then there was also the new gods who though were called gods, could also be recognized as just another race in the universe. Humans were the only ones that didn't have anything which was weird. The fact that there were metahumans proved that humanity should have had some ability of some kind as a whole. The metagene existed in every single human though was dormant in most of them, and wouldn't be triggered unless with special procedures. This father, you mentioned, is he by any chance a Kryptonian as well, unfortunately, no, they found me after my pod crashed on Earth and raised me to become what I am today. If he was a Kryptonian then he would have been the one in this seat now, he was a great inspiration to me oh. Then what can you tell us about your biological family honestly even I don't know much about them. We were sent out of the planet just a few minutes before Krypton was destroyed, and as a baby so never actually met them or anyone from my home planet in fact Clark said truthfully, but James smacked his forehead dumb as you said we, I am anonymous, you are Superman. No nation would be happy to know that there is another being like you alive, James scolded, knowing that Clark could surely hear him just as James expected, Clark who heard what he said began scratching his head as a nervous chuckle, escaped his lips. He too understood what James was saying, and hoped that no one would actually notice his blunder. I am sorry to hear that, but that means that this couple who found you, raised you from when you were just a baby, yeah wow, kudos to the woman that had to feed you. I'm sorry for asking, but exactly when did your powers manifest, now we had James take care of the heavy lifting for us, Martha said as she rubbed her hand against James' back, as a huge smile formed on her face. It was clear that she was incredibly proud of her children, they've always been there, just not to the proportion that they are now, Clark answered sir he's back Kelex called out directly to James mind, I'm coming ma, I need to take care of something, James said as he stood up from his seat and walked to the door as his mother had requested, but as soon as he closed the door, James completely vanished from the environment. The interview between Lois and Clark continued, while James could be seen flying over a popular major city that was popularly known to be the home of the Flash. At the moment, James was watching as a red line was being traced all around the city, and in front of it was a yellow line. The two lines collided at times, but they for the most part were just chasing each other. James watched for a little before an incredibly sinister smile formed on his face. Eobard had once come to kill him, then it was now his duty to make the speedster's life a living hell. Kelex. James called out as a plain black suit was formed on his body, as soon as the black suit was fully formed, it turned reflective, thus rendering James completely invisible to the naked eye, and immediately James dived down towards the yellow streak with all his might, but was careful enough to avoid the buildings in the way. You're too slow, bar what? The yellow flash said as he felt what seemed to be a hand grab onto his leg, the man felt a sharp tug on his feet that caused him to fall and skid across the ground for several meters and into the side of a building. With several bones broken and almost losing consciousness, the man looked up to see James looking down at him. Don't worry, you will experience hell from now on, James said as he turned to the incoming red streak, hello Barry, who are you? Barry asked suspicious of him, but James couldn't blame the poor guy he was chasing after his mother's killer all-round criminal, when suddenly an unknown force caused the other party to fall, and now said unknown force knows his name. It was suspicious, so James understood his reaction. 
My name is Rao L. You can think of me as a guy whose only duty in life is to make this guy regret living, James said, while pointing his earbud whose bones were almost fully healed. How does that explain how you know me? Oh that's simple, it was on your uniform before you changed also advice, get your people to start working on a reflective suit speed is good, but it works when your opponent doesn't expect you, even if the other party is a speedster, James advised, while pointing towards the red suit, I'll keep that in mind, do you have anything else to do with him he caused a problem? I need him to solve oh you can take him anytime you want, James said as he stepped on Eobard's feet with so much force that it shattered, what is wrong with you? Barry shouted nothing, just ensuring he doesn't escape you, now see you, and also in case you ever need help, just call my name, I will hear you, James said as he hovered into the sky and immediately blasted off, this isn't what I signed up for when I began this superhero nonsense, Barry said as he picked up Eobard and zoomed off James on the other hand, had a huge grin on his face. Eobard was the stuff of nightmares for many, but for him, Eobard was some guy he needed to torment, it was just that simple. Eobard may be fast, but he was still stupid, and James planned on bringing common sense to this universe, and common sense is stronger than all. With his mini revenge done, James returned back home and continued watching Clark's interview, while teasing the young man for how he was staring at Lois. The way he looked at her was so obvious and was pointed out by hundreds of people all across and dot space, unknown sector. In the dark reaches of space far beyond Sol, a lifeless solar system could be seen floating around. In this solar system existed that standard celestial bodies that could be found practically everywhere in the galaxy. However unlike most solar systems, this one had a large vessel floating within it. The vessel towered even the mighty planets within the system. Looking a few thousand meters ahead of it, an asteroid field a small field could be seen. Inside the vessel, a small group of people could be seen standing by a window as they stared at the floating rocks. Each of them with varying feelings as they watched as the rocks floated away. Dollar and at number dollar one of them, a being that seemed to be an exactly replica of the human male, said in a strange language, it seemed to be of a higher rank than all the others within the vessel. Hearing its command, the entire group suddenly began to walk into formation while still facing the window, the ship has detected a signal from a nearby solar system, it seems to be Kryptonian however as we are, we cannot respond to it, where are the engineers? I want you to walk around this ship and see what we can salvage enough for interstellar travel, we meet here after two hours the high ranking man, ask yes sir the crew replied before separating to carry out the order do you think it's them? A female voice suddenly spoke up as the man turned to the voice's source, only to see a woman approaching him Feora the man said, as though he was announcing her presence answer the question, general you know normally, that attitude would get you killed however no, I don't think it's them the general replied then why are responding to this signal, even if it's a rescue mission? We don't have enough resources or equipment to help it's from a doomsday ship the general replied, as a sadistic smile appeared on his face, hearing her general and seeing the smile on his face, Feora immediately understood the reason for everything. She may have been born after the Clone War, but even she had heard stories about the doomsday ships, powerful weapons of planetary or even stellar destruction, that was used by the ancestors to conquer the entire galaxy. It was a ship that was capable of all. At least according to the stories she had heard. Apart from its destructive capabilities, the ship was known for another thing. The theory confirmed to be true by all levels of authority on Krypton. The ship was capable of reassigning roles. Each Kryptonian born after the war was engineered for a specific role. The general was born to be a general as she was born to be a lieutenant, it was a predestined affair, but the ship was capable of defying that, and by the will of the admiral who captains it you want to be promoted to councilman? Feora said in realization with the council gone, the ship was the only thing capable of officially electing anyone into the position of councilman. Each doomsday admiral was a councilman because of this specific reason. If the general becomes councilman then he could easily put all the other Kryptonians under him. It wasn't a matter of capabilities or power, their bodies would naturally surrender. Even the general in all his power couldn't overpower the council despite all of them just sitting and doing nothing. The goal is to rebuild Krypton, this is just a stepping stone to that, the general replied then I pledge my allegiance, future councilman Zod Feora said as she knelt and bowed. The move was audacious however, considering that he was the highest ranking amongst all the survivors here, it made sense that he would be the one to get such a position. Zod accepted the bow as they both began walking around and ordering the criminals that had escaped the Phantom Zone with them to repair the salvage ship. Unknown. Located on a large stretch of land that seemed to be underground, a large tower could be seen. The tower looked almost like a pillar as its top touched the very ceiling of the space. The tower lit up against a red background of the space. Compared to all around it, it looked as outlandish as things could get standing before it were two creatures, each with a head and facial features, that made them resemble lizards and arms, almost as long as their entire body. 
It was easy to tell that both creatures were from the same race however both creatures were not of the same skin color, one was red and green. Any progress? A thought rang out amongst them nothing, sir the shell around the tower is almost impenetrable, not even by our abilities, that doesn't make sense, if they had such material, then why didn't they use it against us during the war, the two simply stood with barely any noise, leaving them however a full conversation went on between them in a mental space just like them. Many others stood as they watched or looked at the tower. It was new and way different from what they were used to. None of them knew if this was hazardous to them or not, however they knew one thing, and it was that. It was better to remove it from their planet. Unknown inside a large throne room, a group of people could be seen gathered together before the massive throne in the room. In the entire room, apart from the throne, there was nothing. Sire, we have found an anomaly one of the people said, the creature wore a dark metallic looking clothing that ran from its head and flowed down to the ground. Its facial features though grotesque was still human looking despite the creature's confident words, its actions and behavior remained a bit skittish as it faced a being on the throne. The being in question towered over all in the room, with such a hulking figure that even while seated, the being still intimidated all within the room. It matters not if there is an anomaly or not, the anti-life still eludes me, the being suddenly said in such a calm tone, that still somehow sent shivers down their spine, my lord, we are trying to say that the anomaly may be able to lead us to the anti-life, another one of the creatures in the room said. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.